Well, gee, Bruno, what mm. did Grandpa give you? No clue. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Some kind of gun, I think, but that's about as far as I got. Well, why don't you just point it down the hallway and start banging away on that trigger? Uh, that seems uh, irresponsible. <laughs> I'm disappointed in my own child. Mm. Now, uh, if you're watching this, uh, given our last 101. Yeah, very uh, popular. Yeah, with people who don't necessarily watch the channel. Yeah, I know, a lot of new new viewers. So you may not know who we are, mm. but you have probably been given an old firearm mm -hmm. and are a little lost for what to do. So let's cover some basics. I'm Matthias, I'm a firearms historian. Mm -hmm. This is Bruno, he oh. is our animator for CN Arsenal. And in that role, he has pulled apart and reassembled successfully <sighs> Almost all the guns that he's pulled apart yes, and reassembled. Correct. Uh, <laughs> but there's some experience there. Mm -hmm. um, we are about to give you a guide to what our experience has been and what we understand to be good practices mm -hmm. for handling old guns. Yeah. This is not a exhaustive list by any means. Right. Yeah. Uh, the nuance is almost unlimited. Oh yeah. And the uh, Ways that these things can try to trick or hurt you, you yes. are pretty high. Ooh, yeah, myriad. Yeah. So we are going to kind of turn you on to a number of things to look out for. Mm -hmm. This cannot be everything to look out for. No. And at some level, dealing with old firearms is a risk. Mm -hmm. And it is a risk that you are taking and choosing to take. Yes. We are trying to tell you about those things that we know, and we are going to be very clear that there are unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. Nothing about this video is going to no. guarantee your safety. Nothing can guarantee your safety when dealing with these old firearms. Yeah. So when you watch this, when you're done with it, then you can make some choices. Those choices are yours. We are not responsible for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are advocating nothing but inaction whenever you are uncertain. Yes. So. With all that said, mm -hmm. we would like to help you. We'd like to give you some friendly advice on what to do with these old yes. guns. Uh, what this video isn't, however, is this video assumes that you have shotguns and or have shot guns, not yes. just shotguns. Not just you blew not just not just once, yes, but that you have fired firearms and you are familiar with that and you do it in a safe manner. This is not a one on one help. I've never shot a gun before. What do I do? That's another video. If this seems fast and that you are confused by what I am saying, this video is not yet ready for you. Right. You need to go watch other videos or actually get some proper education. Mm -hmm. But if you are confused by what the four rules of firearm safety are and what they mean, so. Mm -hmm. All guns are loaded. Yes. Keep, Keep your, your finger, finger off, off the trigger. trigger. Yeah. Uh, point, point it in a safe, safe direction, direction at all time. times. Mm -hmm. And be aware of your target and what is beyond it. Yep. Because if those seem unfamiliar or weird to you, oh, you've never heard of them in your life. This ain't for you. Go figure that out first. If you don't have eyes and ears and know what that means, mm -hmm. this ain't for you. That's eye protection and hearing protection. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a video for people who know how to shoot firearms to a degree mm -hmm. and are curious about. Old Ooh. firearms and the particular risks associated them. Mm -hmm. Again, collection of risks, mm -hmm. not an exhaustive list of risks. There are other risks. Mm -hmm. There are always other risks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, we're going to find out why we know there's other risks because oh, yeah. we've some, run we into some, a lot of them. We have some stories, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but let's start with some very basics because mm -hmm. what's going to happen is you're going to be given a firearm. Mm -hmm. And before it's even in your hands, let's say, there are some concerns, which is going to be, number one, don't trust the person who gave it to you. Mm -hmm. And it's not their fault, and we'll yes. cover why in a little bit. We, we love Grandpa, but you know. Yeah. Grandpa could be 100% right and know everything, and still you should not trust what he is telling you about that firearm. Mm -hmm. You need to observe the firearm and get other opinions on the firearm mm -hmm. before you use the firearm. Yes. Watching this video, is also not enough to know mm -hmm. if that firearm is mm -hmm. safe. This is a guide to how to investigate, and then you must conduct some investigation. Okay, and then uh, beyond that, this, I know this is insane. Don't pull the trigger on that thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, don't pull the trigger on that thing because yeah. it might be loaded. Which you should know, right? If you shot guns before, but regardless, right. uh, even yeah. if you know, if checked, it's unloaded. Don't pull the trigger on the old guns because right. uh, these guns are old and uh, dry firing them over, well, in some cases centuries potentially, can break things over thousands of you know iterations. And you don't want to be that guy yeah. who gets an old gun, pulls the trigger, and you hear snap, crackle, pop, and now you're firing pins in five pieces. Yeah, it's always great and I've heard it before. Oh. Somebody's just like, hey, this is pretty cool. 
Click. And then you hear yeah. clink on the other side of the room. Uh, it's it's awful. It now, sucks. there are, I'm going to get tons of comments about this. Mm -hmm. There are lots of guns 100 years old that you could dry fire 20, 30 million times. Oh, yeah. And they'll never no. break. Yep. There's also Nambus. There's yes. also Astra 300s, both yeah. guns I've seen shed firing pins mm. in person. Oh, yeah. uh, there's also uh, rimfire guns, yeah, in which you will damage it because oh, it's, it's just, just the way yeah. it, it works. Yeah. So just don't dry fire old guns mm -hmm. until you are an expert on that gun, mm -hmm. and then you can know whether or not you can dry fire it. And at that point, you probably have spare firing pins anyway. Mm -hmm. So for now, don't pull the trigger because you don't know what's going on, mm -hmm. and don't trust Grandpa. Don't mm -hmm. trust the guy at the. We'll get into it. Yeah. Don't trust any one person. It's yeah. time to Even use. If, especially if they really sound like they know what they're talking about. And if they're very sure, yeah. Just not grandpa, not us. Not, it's time to turn yeah. on your thinky Second brain. Guess everything. Yeah. It's time to turn on your thinky brain. You're dealing with a firearm and you're dealing with a inherently unreliable one in the sense that you don't know what happened to it from yeah. factory to you. Yeah, you don't know what the history of this gun is. Yeah. All right, let's get into some of these questions because they're going to be based off of what we expect the questions you might have or the anxieties you might mm -hmm. have are. Yep. So we're going to run some topics. We're going to try to hammer them down a little bit. But again, mm -hmm. Not everything. No. What exactly do I have here? Okay, so first thing, pretty uh, pretty obvious. There's usually some sort of lettering on these guns that tell you manufacturer, you know, uh, gauge, that sort of thing. So just, you know, read on the side of the gun or wherever. Sometimes some guns have it kind of spread all over the place. I know Winchester's have it usually on the uh, tang back here, stuff like that. But, you know, so, you know, Fabrique Nationale d'Armes de Guerre, Herstal. Okay, so I punch that into Google and maybe I get a fan. Oh, okay, that might be what I'm looking at. So I know it's, okay, I, I might know it's a shotgun. So that's a starting point. Right, so describe the thing. Shotgun, put in those words. See what? Do an image search and mm -hmm. see if it looks a lot like, like you. A lot, not a little. A lot of a people lot. get kind of general about it. And they're like, yeah. well, it's got pieces of wood on it and it's metal. But yeah, a lot like that. Vague, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then what else? We might get lucky. We might have chamber marks. So let's take a look at this one real um, quick. Yeah, so in this one, it also says uh, Browning Arm, Arms Company, Ogden, Utah. So there's another company uh, that you could look up. But it also says Full 12 Special Steel. Now, it can tell us a lot, mm -hmm. or it can be very deceptive. We'll get that to, uh, get to that in a moment. Yes. So read the gun, mm -hmm. and then Google it. Yeah, see what see what shows up. You would be amazed at how many people do not make it this far in the process. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of information now available on the web about these firearms. Mm -hmm. If it's not something extremely rare, it should show up just fine. And yeah. sometimes you'll get cross pollination of things that are similar. Or if you do have something very rare, it might be misidentified. That's that's very real. Yeah. So, Bruno, would you have a recommendation for what you would do? after you've checked the markings and you're still kind of striking out or you're unsure of what you're looking at, or it feels like it's been modified in some way in your eye. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, usually if you're still a little unsure, I would say, you know, contact uh, gun boards, you know, other, other right. shooters, enthusiasts, people who are into this sort of thing, they'll probably be able to help you narrow it down. Generally, if you can get a company name, there's going to be a forum dedicated to that company yes. almost every time. There's mm -hmm. going to be like a Marlin Collectors or a Winchester Collectors. Yep. And if you don't, then what you'll probably start to see is some forum responses. Mm -hmm. And those forum responses, those are forums of people that are talking about this yeah. kind of thing. So maybe go register there. So Gun Boards is a big one that people go to to talk about these things. Yep. Uh, the other thing is there's a lot of people on Reddit that shoot and talk about guns. Yeah, so you may already have an words. account like that. Yeah. But the truth is, at some level, you're probably going to have to start talking to someone else. Yeah. In order, If you're confused or worried about what you've identified, you have to talk to someone else. Yeah. And then after you've done that process, and I want to be <laughs> clear about this, yes. then you can seek out subject matter experts, which are the people that you go to when a gun really can't be identified, mm -hmm. or by the community. You know, yeah, nobody and has. nine times out of ten, by the time you ask the community and they don't Somebody, know, yeah, they're gonna tell you who to ask. Yeah, yeah, just ask this guy. He yeah. Knows, yeah. So uh, if the community doesn't know, then you reach out to someone like myself, mm -hmm. um, who can help you get in touch with the people. Because the one thing I get a lot is like people are like, "Hey, I got this 22 Flobert, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not a specialist in, you know, like one-off Belgian sure. 22s. Mm -hmm. I might know a guy, and so what I'll do is mm -hmm. I'll take that information to a, a smaller cadre of people and ask. Right. But I'm gonna tell you nine times out of 10, if it's to the point that I don't recognize it, it's not recognizable. And you're gonna have to get, mm -hmm. that, that's something you might have to be comfortable with. Bruno and I have encountered. Yeah, there's a, some, some, sometimes you just don't know. Yeah, yeah like a dozen firearms? How many do you think we've seen that are just 
yeah, it either or somebody has modified at some point. And now you're not sure. Like I, I don't know exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, it can get weird. So don't don't believe that you're gonna find every model every no. time. Be willing to understand that sometimes weird stuff turns up. Yeah. More might, often than you'd think. You might be lucky and not know it yet. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, and then the last thing is, and I want to say this very clearly, uh, <laughs> just because it's special doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. That's a good way to put it, yeah. It's a polite way to put it. Yeah. yeah. So I get, do you, do you happen to know what comes through our inbox the most? Like what gun gets mentioned like once a uh, week? I think usually, don't you get a lot of Carcano questions? Carcano. <laughs> and so the reason for that is because the Italian Carcano has a certain number of military variations. Mm -hmm. And then when they were imported in the United States oh, back yeah. in the 50s, 60s, 60s yeah. uh, a lot of them were seen as being like cumbersome or unwanted in the sporting market. Yeah. And they would make what was commonly called the Santa Fe's, the, mm -hmm. the sporterized versions of these Oh, guys. yeah, just start cutting stuff away, making them lighter. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a ton of those floating around, and they oh. go for very cheap, mm -hmm. and people wander into them because they see that they're cheap. Right. And then I get emails that are like, well, I saw a guide that you had that said, these are the models. Right. Mine is different. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, it's always <laughs> like one in five of them, the fact that it's different means that it must, must be, be Mussolini's yeah, they want, personal. They want to believe they just hit the jackpot, and it's like, sorry, no. Somebody, yeah. somebody just cut up your Carcano and made it lighter. If you're not receiving a gun as a gift, if you're actually looking for old guns, if it's cheap enough and you feel comfortable buying something you don't know what it is, that's fine. You don't think of it like a lotto ticket. It, it never pays no, off to not know what you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, no, that's not a good way to do it. Yeah, they think, it's kind of like an antique roadshow thing where people are like, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Chances are, if you're in a gun show full of people, someone else is already aware Probably, of what, yeah. like, yeah. you can still get lucky, but you get lucky by reading a lot yeah, before. You, if you, yeah, you gotta do a lot of book reading and yeah. so you know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So, um, try not to pick fights with people because you have Mussolini's personal, <laughs> yeah. yeah, cuckoo clock. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's really about it for identification. It's much simpler than you think. It's more community driven than you think. Yeah. And you really actually wanna get into the habit of researching it yourself so that when you find the next one, because if you're if you're just emailing someone like me, and I'm not trying to just push this off. Right. If you're emailing someone like me, you're waiting. It's like a week turnaround because yeah, I've got so many. Yeah, it'd probably be faster to do it yourself. Right, but if you time. develop that skill, you can mm -hmm. go out and find things mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah, and also you can become that part of that community that could help somebody else eventually if they suddenly get something. What are you like an altruist or something here? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> he is the sweet. One. Yeah. All right. So what's next? Is it at this very moment safe? Here you go, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Grandpa. I'm gonna immediately finger bang this trigger right at Grandma's face. Uh, okay, no. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you do want to make sure your guns are unloaded, and I know that that sounds like something that would fall under our "you already know how to handle a firearms" policy. Yeah. Sometimes it gets weird. Oh yeah, especially with older guns, because some of them don't operate the way you might be used to. Yeah. So check this out. I'm just gonna. Hey, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know that many people watching this video would be confused by this operation. No, I, well, a lot of people have seen that, that action done in movies or stuff like that, so they, I think they understand the concept of it. And it's all exactly this easy, isn't it, Bruno? There's oh, no oh, yeah. possible oh, thing. Yeah, no, it's not like somebody, you know, might use a different system to unlock a, a shotgun oh, or something Oh, yes, like the that. old Burgess. So I'm just going to pump or mm. pull or maybe the hammer needs to be back. Uh, or? I mean... Yeah, so it's back, but you don't know if it's loaded yet. Let's so take a look at this fun guy, right? Yeah, look at that. That's the Burgess. <laughs> the only way to, by the way, the original Burgess, you just grab a hold of this and pump on back with your wrist. Yeah, but it's, it's this scary. is an even more different one, right? And they have put a release button here that must be depressed forward in order to unlock that action so that you can pull the whole thing yeah. to the rear. And yeah. then the only way to inspect it is at the top of the gun, which is not something that you're always used to either. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways that old guns can really mess with you. Uh, do we have another example, actually? I think we have another really weird opener, like uh, somebody we oh, just showed it to. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, the Galan, 1868. Yeah. This is a revolver, yeah, right? Let's yeah, look at it, it can't here. be that hard. I mean, it's hard. Now, some of you are arms historians, and some of you are, you know, fairly quick on the uptake, but how do you open something like this? It's not a swing-out cylinder, mm -hmm. and it's got this weird mechanism. It's, yeah. Turns out you pull back here, right there, and then you rock forward on this lever, and that's how you get into the gun. 
a lot of people aren't going to know these little secrets. They're going to no. struggle. Yeah. And I know it seems like, yeah, give me 10 minutes and I'll figure that out. But in that 10 minutes, you have a potentially loaded handgun. Yeah, you don't know. And you're spinning it around mm. trying to figure out how to get into it and pointing it in various directions. That can be pretty... It's, it's dicey. Yeah. yeah. So whenever possible, uh, let's go with the four rules again. Right. And assume it's loaded and keep it pointed in a safe direction. Definitely. And de-emphasize handling in favor of knowledge. So if you can safely point it away from you and try to read about it, or safely point mm -hmm. it where it's not going to hurt anybody and take a photo, as soon as you're confused, it's okay to quickly ask for some help yeah. online. And, and this isn't, you know, this isn't a race. The gun's not going anywhere. You know, you're right. not going to lose anything by taking your time and making sure you don't, you know. There's not a countdown in which the cartridge randomly fires. Right. <laughs> yeah. You manipulating it is going to make it unsafe. It is not inherently mm -hmm. unsafe in its condition. No. You usually. I mean, it'd be a re if it was inherently unsafe, uh, we're already in bomb squad yeah, level that's anyway. A, that's a different scenario. So, generally, the best thing to do is to be very patient. Now, the other thing that you can do is once you do know how the mechanism works, and it's stuck. Mm. So, what's your advice there, Bruno? I mean, I personally, I would say try and see why it's stuck. Definitely don't force it, uh, especially with these older guns, because... Uh, and yet force it. Yeah, it's... <laughs> it, apply pressure, but at some point, if you feel like it's not going to go, you know, you can always... If you apply too much pressure and you break something, you know, you're kind of done. You know, you can't really I, walk back I, from that I easily. like to say for most steel old guns, mm -hmm. If you feel like you're wrestling it to the point that you're doing the grip strength thing, like you're sitting there with the grip strength meter and you're burned down on it, right? Mm -hmm. We're getting into that range of maybe give up. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and you can do that. You can sit there and just fight a slide mm -hmm. on a handgun, and you're really not going to tear it up trying to push with your soft, fleshy body. No. But invariably, somebody starts to get out like the hammer yeah. or the torch. Yeah. That's... And they start doing wacky stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you're desperate to not have to go to the gunsmith, you can do things like get all the wood off of a gun. And sure. if it's like a handgun that will fit in a little bucket, you can put it in with kerosene and let it soak for a couple days. Yeah, try and lubricate it a bit. Yep. And so there's other stuff like with people say like transmission fluid and yada, all these other concoctions. Uh, the sure. problem is you start to run into finish risks depending on what the finish is made out of. Yeah. Um, if it's not a painted gun, not mm -hmm. paint on there, like so a lot of British guns have paint yes. on them. Okay. Kerosene won't mess with bluing. Mm -hmm. it, it will mess with paint. So yeah, it might strip it. before even you go that far, realistically, if you're in the point where you're slamming on it or trying to use chemicals to get it open. Yeah, that, that's your cue to back up and, and yeah. reassess. Yeah. So you're going to have to make friends with a gunsmith. That's just the only way out. Um, I know a really popular gun that does this, by the way, or a formerly popular gun, lemon squeezers. Oh, yeah, yeah. The old Smith & Wessons with the safety. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many of those guns locked up. And it just sucks, but sometimes you just got to take it to the gunsmith so that he can soak it and not ruin it. Or he has, yeah. a lot of times those guys have uh, uh, shoot tanks mm -hmm. so that they can just fire a round off and just make sure that that round is dead that's, that's in there. Mm -hmm. So... Take it to professional. It cost you a few bucks, but yeah, you don't, you don't want to take chances with that kind of stuff, though. No, no, not at all. Um, so yeah, really, just go easy, guys. I know. I I want to be sympathetic here because we know the feeling. Oh yeah, no, we've gotten some guns where you're just like, do I need to push her a little bit harder, or should I? Yeah. <laughs> should I stop? It's like I was standing over at Rod and Gun the other day, mm -hmm. and they had a Vetterly in there, mm -hmm. and you go to lift the the bolts lock shut. You right. go to lift that bolt handle, and I can't see it cam in the lock in mm -hmm. there. And it's not doing anything. Mm. And I just did that thing where you have that impulse to be like, what if, what if I just take it on the edge of this desk and just... Yeah. And when you're I starting mean, to bring in mechanical leverage, don't might, get me you wrong. You might get it open, but at what cost? It's, I, I don't know. know what's loose in there. Mm -mm. Like, I don't know if something snapped off in there. I don't yeah. know... Or if, if doing that will snap something off. Right. I'm not sure, yeah. That's, no, at the same time, Mo's in the gun with a failed case. Oh, yeah. yeah Sometimes yeah. you can take that thing and take it to a park bench and just <laughs> beat the handle open. But that's a gun you already have been into and you understand what has failed inside of. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make that gamble. On a gun you don't right. know 100%. Yeah. You don't even know if it's loaded and if you're going to run into a discharge issue. Yeah, or, yeah. There's a lot know. of variables. Yeah. Because think about like the Vetterly. The Vetterly, that firing pin is tied into that cocking system. So if that's cracked through and you start banging on that and there's a round in there, mm -hmm. that thing might that be could, able to... They might, yeah. It gets dangerous. Yeah. So... 
don't. Just take it to a professional mm -hmm. uh, outside of a little self-experimentation with everything pointed in a very safe direction. Not mm -hmm. even like try not to have it pointed at your neighbor's house because you think his brick wall will stop it. Yeah, it's... It, it's tricky how much you have to think about all the angles because sometimes you're sitting in your house and you realize, oh, if this if this fired, it's going to go through. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the bigger the gun, the more you got to watch that. Yeah. Like there's some honking old full size military cartridge yeah. rifles out there. Um, who is it? Stuff. Somebody told us a story about Springfield. Actually, we should probably give this a. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> someone told us that they were at a gun shop, and somebody brought in an old Springfield muzzle loading black powder rifle, mm -hmm. cap and ball. Yep. Uh, <laughs> And the, oh wait, here, bring me, here, wait, okay, let's pretend this is the Springfield, ready? Okay. Okay, here, you, you, you bring this in, ready? Yeah. Oh, I know what that is, they had these back in the day, it's cap and ball, it's black powder, I'll show you how it works. I mean, right now it's unloaded, so I'm just going to take a cap right here, and just stick it right on there, mm -hmm. check this out, and then you just go like this, and you drop the hammer, and then you put a hole through like three <laughs> walls, yeah. because, by the way, Every muzzle loader is yeah, loaded. That, that's not even an exaggeration, honestly. Like, yeah. Because you, you can't see down in that barrel. You have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, how many times have you seen a muzzle loader that didn't have a round in it? Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I have. Honestly. Yeah. No, it's such a pain to load those. Most of those old guys left them loaded and then oh, stuck yeah. them in the closet yeah. and then just never put a cap on them. Yeah. Or, yeah. And then they maybe pass away, and then it just sits there for a while. Nobody looks into it, you know. You live in a place with good humidity, and that thing can oh, work just boy. fine a hundred years later. Mm -hmm. So, don't mess around with uh, muzzle loaders, particularly. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're on to the next question, right? Yep. What is this worth? Hey, uh, so Gramps gave me this uh, weird gun, like the the barrel tips up. It's That's uh, rad. yeah, it says it's nine millimeter. That seems convenient, but. Uh, Kind of curious now. What's uh, what's this thing worth? Yeah, well, um, I don't know, mm. but I know how we can find out. Oh yeah. I've got my phone here, uh -huh. and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you and everybody at home Ian McCollum's personal phone number so that you can ask him. No, um, <laughs> I get yeah, a lot of these not, emails. Ian mean. gets a lot of these emails, and mm. here's the problem. What you are asking for at this point is an appraisal. Right. You are wanting to know the value, the market value of a firearm. Mm. Which sounds easy, super easy, right? Like how much things is worth is something that anybody with any sort of positional knowledge should understand. Yes. However, mm. when it comes to older stuff, yeah, not so cut and dry. Bruno, if you were an appraiser, how would you know exactly how much this gun's worth? Uh, well, I would have to do some research. Right. For sure, because uh, assuming I'm even familiar with the gun at all, but I would definitely, first thing, look up the model, assuming we know what it is, and say, how about they're sold recently? Say, you know, last three, five years, you know, if you go on... Even five starting to stretch it, but sure. Yeah, sure, yeah. The closer you get, the more accurate, in theory, the picture is. But, you know, see what this gun has... What what have people bought this gun for? What were they willing to pay for it at that time? Will you hand me the other Jolo R? Mm, yes. Okay. So, I have a Jolo R and 9mm Largo at this point, with mm. that cool cocky thing, right? <laughs> I have a Jolo R in 380 with no cocky thing. It's gone. Mm. Sad Which thing. one's worth? The, are they, they're worth exactly the same, right? Whatever the uh, highest one this one for, this one's worth because it's broken, but it's the same thing. Right, it's just a little smaller. So yeah. It's, eh. Eh. Mm. Or is this one worth more because maybe they made fewer 380s and That's even true. with the missing part, yeah. maybe this is really, really rare and somebody yeah. will pay more for it. Yeah, also maybe because it's in a more common caliber, you know. Oh, somebody, yeah, yeah. somebody might be able to actually enjoy it easily instead of having to find 9mm Largo, so, so a lot of variables. The problem you're going to find is that the actual value of a firearm is usually dictated by auction, mm -hmm. and it is an auction in which two people must be actively pursuing it, because if you have a gun that is very rare, but only one person is in the market looking for it at that time, only one collector has caught on to the fact that mm -hmm. it's in that auction at that time, well then he can put in a low bid and he'll get it. Probably. So you need at least two people who want to buy it, mm -hmm. and you need them to fight over it, and you need that to have happened at an auction, because it's the only way you can see it, right. at an auction that lists their prices publicly after the auction, right. and an auction that's happened in the past couple of years. Yeah. And that gun must be identical to your gun. Yes. Identical. <laughs> right. Uh, same year. Yeah. The two serial numbers off. Uh, and if that gun had any provenance, you must understand that you must discount for that. So if that gun mm -hmm. came with the uh, 
uh, medical records for just how many times they caught that guy with double syphilis, mm. that gun's probably worth more. If yours comes with none of that, it's mm. worth less. It's kind of vanilla. Yeah. So the problem what you're starting to realize is, is, is kind of, it's guesstimation. It's a lot of oh, guesswork. Yeah. It's always a guess, yeah. And the people who understand how to do this are people who have spent a lot of time mm -hmm. dealing with random firearms yep. and getting them to sell. So when I think of someone that may be like a subject matter expert on this, I think about like Morphe's auctions or Rock Island mm -hmm. auction, like yep. the big auction houses. Yeah, that's their whole business, yep. And yet, nine, 900 out of 1,000 guns that you find are going to be the sort of guns you don't take to a big auction like that, that aren't worth the big dollars. No, yeah. Uh, I know you're hoping it is, but <laughs> generally it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're going to end up in a situation where you need to ballpark this. Mm -hmm. And the easiest ballpark that I know of is to go to gun broker, find completed auctions mm -hmm. of that gun, mm -hmm. and take an average of ones that had bids on them. The danger is, and everybody falls for this, you know what the danger is, Bruno? Mm -hmm. In terms of overpricing things? Zero bids. Because just because somebody listed it for two thousand dollars, yeah, doesn't mean anybody wanted to pay that much. I'm gonna tell you, I can go on eBay right now. I can dish out a big spoonful of belly button lint, and I can put it up there for two hundred bucks. Bruno, are you gonna buy that? I'm not in the market. I yeah, mean, I know. Maybe you is. get lucky. Well, you know, <laughs> might get lucky, but no problem. And just because you then years later get a hold mm -hmm. of a big pile of Matthias belly button lint, that doesn't mean. That it's worth two hundred dollars no. because it didn't sell for that. Right. Yeah. There's a difference between value and price in this case. Right. And so, if you're trying to find value, you need to understand that what you're looking for is an appraiser. Mm -hmm. um, and I generally don't do them. Uh, I'll get emails all the time. No. And the problem I mean, is, it's, it's work. It's not trivial. It's rare that I could even appraise one because right. it would have to be something that I had already been in the market for mm -hmm. and had been observing the market for. Right. Because if it's not that then it's gonna take me, realistically, it's gonna take me looking up some completed auctions and then waiting months to see if anything happens in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's ten I tend to price check stuff by starting to watch it for a couple months and I yeah, tend to watch an item for months one. before I buy one of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can't really do that for other people. It's, it's too much work. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's people that have careers that are based around that. Those are the people to reach out to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think. I think we got it covered, right? Is there anything else for evaluation? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Is it safe to shoot? Well, Grandpa gave me this thing. It says nine mil on the side, so mm -hmm. I'm just gonna. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's cool. It's 400-day critical defense. This is the good stuff, right? Yeah, I'm just gonna... but uh, I know it says nine millimeter on there, um, but uh, I want to double check. No, that's fine. I found it in the back of the closet. It's covered in cobwebs. Uh, smells a bit like shit, so mm. let's rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> Bruno, what does it take to be prepared to actually shoot an old firearm? Uh, a lot of inspection, <laughs> some, some time. Uh, this is definitely a process you don't want to rush. Well, we've got two critical components, one of which I already talked about, which is the ammunition, but we'll mm. get there in a moment. The other thing is the gun itself. So mm. let's talk about inspecting a firearm. Uh, where are you going to start, Bruno? We got the gun open. Mm -hmm. We know it's empty. We know what the gun vaguely is. Right. Um, for me, uh, I tend to start on board, but what do you think? Where are you going to start looking? Uh, yeah, I would agree. Actually, this is a particularly interesting example because it's got a nifty little uh, pop-up barrel. Ooh, let's show that over here. Yeah. Where are so, we at? I'm going to flip that over. Oh, yes. So if you hit this little lever... So, yeah, Rad. we should bring that feature back. It's a yeah. great feature. So with this barrel, we can we can eyeball down it in a safe yeah. way. Yeah, and it seems. Let's do it. <laughs> Try you that. sure? No, uh, it's, I can't it seems, read it as well this way. Uh, I think it's better. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> is, yeah. Uh, as you know, the funny thing is this inspection is where people get a little crazy because yeah. you have the four rules. And the minute you need to inspect the firearm... You're going to have to break one of them at yes, some point. Yes, because you do need to see both ends, especially on long guns. You need yep. to see both ends of the board. Mm -hmm. So you are going to have to start at the rear and make sure everything's nice and clear. Yes. Which we already did. Mm -hmm. And then 
you need to check the front. Yeah. And it's really I, weird to do as that. As long as you're consciously aware, you know, you know that I know it's, it's clear, I've cleared it, I know it's, then it's fine. And it's going to get a lot worse for revolvers in a second. Uh, yeah. But what are we looking for in the bore? So we're looking at the grooves and the lands on it, seeing the condition they're in. Unless uh, it's a shotgun. Unless, yes, unless it's a smooth bore weapon, but if it's rifled, it will have grooves down the barrel. And we just want to see what condition it's in. Are they nice and sharp and nice and crisp, or are they worn out, or are they just completely shot? Is the barrel rusted, right? Is it pitted, especially in older guns? Or, you know, Grandpa shot some uh, corrosive ammunition through it, didn't really clean it that well, stuck it in a closet 40 years later, that's gone. Right. You know? Flashlight is your friend. Yes. Patience is your friend. Mm -hmm. And then honestly, if you can't tell what you're looking at, Go to the next step, which is cleaning this thing up, and then come back and do this step. Yes. Uh, and then, even then, if you've got it all scrubbed out and it still looks hinky to you, gunsmith. Yes. It's okay mm -hmm. to go ask someone to take a you look at it. Can't be too safe with this stuff. Because yeah. the fear is that the pitting will be deep enough. Yeah. If it's too much metal has been eaten away, especially in parts that hold pressure, that might fail when you shoot it. Uh, mm, so, ugh. on that front, mm. if I'm looking on this gun, I've inspected inside the, the bore, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm especially being cautious of what might be going on in the chamber area. Mm -hmm. But I got to look at the outside too. Oh, yeah. So I don't really want to take it out of stock. That's fine, right? I can just go <sighs> ahead and look at the top. And if the top looks good, obviously the bottom is good. I, you know, it's one of those things, and I've done it too, but honestly, it's, when every time you get a especially older gun that looks a little bit worn, I know it's a pain, guys, but you have to take it apart. You have to see the underside of that metal that's all hidden in the wood because yeah it could look great on the upside and then on the on the bottom is just eaten away it looks like swiss cheese and you have no idea until you pull the trigger and bad the, things happen depending on the gun the stock the humidity the, the, the so place many was variables, kept yeah. you could have a gun that's pure rust up top and then under the wood line Beautiful. it's mint that's honestly what you prefer a lot of the time <laughs> yeah vice versa though eh. and you can start to have some centimeter deep like, you can get, you can get pits kind of, all the way it, through. It can, it can happen. Early, yeah. And sometimes it looks really bad until you clean it, and then you realize, oh, it's not that bad. It still looks pretty good. So you right. just don't know until you take it apart. So, again, pitting is the number one thing to look for. Rust mm -hmm. is the number two thing to look for because you need to knock that loose to see if there's any pitting under it. Mm, yes. From there, you can have bad rifling. You can have bad wear. Yeah, you can just have guns that are worn out. Right. That's a, if I were to have, let's say this gun's shot out. Let's say that the rifling's gone. It's, it's gone, practically right? smooth bore. Mm -hmm. Is that going to put me at risk? Not necessarily. I mean, it could work. You might get some blowover, some gas leakage yes. if the chamber's worn out. Uh, and following the four rules, that bullet might end up going, you know, a little wider. A little wider than you might expect, so keep that in mind. Yeah, but probably not going to cause any real problems. No. Um, it, it's going to end up that you have too much room in your bore, and you're going to get a little skittering in there. Yeah, it's, it's not going to be around. accurate. Mm -hmm. you're or, get... Yeah, or sometimes the, maybe the muzzle's damaged, the bullet leaves, and it starts tumbling. And... But it doesn't make a left turn. No. If you're, still... if you're shooting safe with good margins, everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a range safety thing. Again, not part of this thing. Yes. Uh, so wear is not the worst unless it starts to have things like the kind of where, where the safeties don't work and then somebody relies on the safety. Yeah. So I highly recommend if you're working with a gun that is new to you and old to life and you've decided that it is safe to shoot, I want to make sure I say this part ahead of time, mm -hmm. do not rely on the mechanical safeties that are engaged no, in the gun. This is, this is your safety right here. Yeah. Uh, but before you even get that far, there's mm -hmm. other things. Uh, there are guns that lock, there are guns that don't lock, so mm -hmm. blowback pistols. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, or like a bolt action rifle like this where it has locking surfaces. Yes, it's, it's if, shit. if your gun is locking, you need to understand what the locking surfaces are mm -hmm. and whether or not they are engaging. This has been a big fear for like Marlin shotguns, although mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit of an inverted myth. But yeah. uh, the point being though is just because you've closed this gun up, how do you know that that action is not coming back at you? I mean, right. if you think about... Yeah, so maybe not the Mauser so much because the Mauser is a ideal gun. Yeah, it's a pretty. pretty if you've inherited a, a Mauser, you're probably pretty, pretty safe, even yeah. if there are problems. But mm -hmm. still, be careful. Mm -hmm. But you know, something like this, where if it blows wide open, this is all coming back at me. Right if at it you. fails, it's coming out of the gun. I mean, Paul Mauser himself lost yeah. an eye mm -hmm. testing something, mm -hmm. so guns do have those sort of failures. But I mean, mm -hmm. that's some scary stuff right there. Uh, yeah. 
you might want to know how this locks mm -hmm. and make sure that when you go forward, that lock is engaged Gaged, and yep. it's not opening itself up. Yep. And if you are not aware of how to test that in the gun you have, no dice. Mm -hmm. Like, be aware yeah. of how it locks yeah, and whether or not it is yeah, locked. Yeah, ideally you need to understand how it functions and how it locks and check the locking surfaces, make sure, you know, because over time they will get worn down, rounded over, etc. And they'll hold usually, but at some point, sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. So um, we covered locking surface, we covered unlocked guns to a degree. We covered bore. There are metallurgical concerns because there yeah. are two types of gunpowder. Yeah, you have your modern ubiquitous smokeless powder, and then you also have yes, and then you also have black powder. Good old, Maybe. Mm, I don't know. Uh, and you know, uh, there's a lot of science and physics that I probably am not good enough to explain. However, there are different pressure curves. Some guns, especially you know, 19th century older guns, were made to handle black powder. And if you shove smokeless powder in them, you're going to have a bad day. Yeah, you'll see people doing equivalent loads, which is that I it creates X percentage of, or X uh, psi. Uh, and so I'm gonna, if it creates XPSI in black powder, I'm gonna make a smokeless load that also creates XPSI, and therefore I will be safe. It sounds good, but uh, pressure curves, man. Right, it's... the way that those powders burn and expand mm -hmm. is different. It Very. creates a different type of shock to the yep. system. Yep. Don't just substitute and be like, well, it's reduced enough. Mm. Um, a good example of things that you should be careful of are Damascus barrels, which this gun mm -hmm. actually has. Um, we'll get you a nice photo of it, because Damascus, you can recognize in a heartbeat, thanks to those swirls. Yes, it looks real pretty. And what that is, is it's essentially braided steel. It's like yeah, it's steel sort of that has been like wound coil. into a, mm -hmm. if you've ever, I, I shouldn't say braided steel, because it's another thing, but yeah. if you've ever seen girls braid their hair, it's the same it's, way. You wrap same it up, idea, yeah, along a and hammer and it until it becomes a thing, a and tube. then wrap it up mm -hmm. again. And But that's a way to make a solid steel borable tube mm -hmm. out of, Smaller pieces of steel. Yes, and uh, it was used for a long time, and it works. However, it, it was designed for a certain pressure, out, pressure and load. And depending on, it's also an artisanal thing. Mm -hmm. Depending on the Damascus and who did it and how it was done, it can be extremely strong mm -hmm. or kind of weak. Right. And then even beyond Damascus, you can get wire twist, where it's just coils of wire, mm -hmm. and so you'll just have these like stripings that look almost like a, a vinyl record. Right. Mm, be careful of that. Yes. Yeah. And then even when you get into steel, steel quality is one of the things that has actually been probably one of the biggest changes over the first 60 years of oh, yeah. this century. Mm -hmm. And the common, like the best quality steel that was in firearms in the 1900, like mm -hmm. right at 1900, mm -hmm. is probably equivalent to okay steel even now because right. we've just gotten so mm -hmm. good at refining steel. Oh yeah, we've gotten a lot better at it. So yeah. Uh, and remember, guys, a lot of these guns are also old. You know, they've, if people have shot them over the years, they've experienced so many cycles, you know, stuff expands, contracts, heat sub, cools down. You know, there's, there's some wear there. Metal is a fluid, given enough time and, and pressure. And, exactly. Yeah. So it'll flow, and mm -hmm. you don't want to be the one that it, it sort of flows out on. Mm -hmm. uh, so be patient, understand mm -hmm. what you're looking at, and again, when in doubt, Gunsmith, yeah. it's perfectly fine. And I know we're kind of playing these up as if they're all super dangerous. We're not. We're trying to explain to you the number of ways that you yeah, can get Yeah, they're hurt. not dangerous until they are. Right. It's, yeah. Okay, so we talked about metal. Mm -hmm. We talked about barrels and locks and things like that. Uh, one thing I would add, actually, is also uh, sometimes uh, previous owners go inside and start uh, changing things. Cause you yes. know, maybe they think, oh, this trigger pulls a little heavy or man, you know, I, I, I know what I'm, I know better than John Browning. I know what I'm doing in here. I can make this gun even better. And you have no idea. I have a mint condition. I mean, mint condition Stevens 200 shotgun. It's a rare shotgun. And I was so happy to get it. And I went to dry test it with snap caps and I could not get it to behave. Mm. And I'm glad I dry tested it with snap caps because when I went in there, mm. someone had actually welded inside the action. That does a couple of things. It can change the metallurgy mm -hmm. and make a part softer or weaker. Yep. Like it can make a part softer and therefore mush. It can make a part harder, harder kind of but therefore it's more likely to shear yes. when it's supposed to be softer. Mm -hmm. So messing around with temper radical temperature changes on metal, yeah. 
it not gets, good. Gets iffy, yeah. and, but somebody had been in there welding trying to fix something that it was a safety mm. interlock that they did not understand. Mm -mm. And so I've been back in there repairing it, but mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing in there. Um, so be very careful. Even a mint condition looking gun can be a time bomb waiting to happen if you do not look inside of it and mm -hmm. understand what's happening there. Which is why I, again, highly advocate using you know, dummy cartridges and cycling mm -hmm. things and figuring them out before you get involved in shooting something. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so we talked about metal. Mm -hmm. What's another limitation of the gun? Well, uh, this is a great example, actually. Some guns have wood on them. <laughs> They're not all metal <laughs> or plastic or modern ones. You uh, can make guns out of wood, sort of. Yeah, and uh, it's really pretty and it works. However, wood, you know, is a flexible thing. Mm. It, can, it, ex it uh, absorbs water. You know, it can warp, it can bend, it can crack. Uh, and a lot of times those cracks aren't uh, super obvious if right. you're just glancing it. So a big example of that, let's, this guy This guy's kind of an example that he seems like he's been sanded and you can feel, like you can feel when a gun's been sanded by whether or not the metal sits proud over the wood. Mm -hmm. um, but let me get this guy out of the way because mm -hmm. that guy, despite being sanded, has no structural loss to his wood. The wood is very strong. Yes. This guy is very interesting. This is our FN Auto 5, and I brought this guy specifically for this video because he's really on the nose about some things. We have, if we look right here, we have a crack that's in a square shape that's obviously been a repair by somebody before. Mm -hmm. That's something for me to keep an eye on and to go back in and see that it's properly reinforced and not just sort of loosely glued on there. I don't want that coming off while I'm shooting. If we flip it over and we look, we have a crack right about here that you can probably make out. But when we go into the gun, you will find out that this crack, despite looking pretty bad, is superficial. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the front, you see nothing. Everything looks fine, okay? So let's go into this gun for a second. I'm gonna pop that back and just rotate this off. And we're gonna make an example out of this. Cause this looks like a very clean FN Auto 5. Like I mean, if yeah, you yeah, saw this, a, you would assume. It looks fine to me. So first warning sign here is as I'm coming off, mm -hmm. Feeling a little tightness, right? Mm. And then, that means my wood is dragging on the spring. I probably had some sogginess going on there. I need to look into it. I'm gonna set all this other stuff aside without dropping it. Mm. We're gonna look just at the wood. I'm gonna use my flashlight to try to help you guys a little bit. Um, I know we're having some filming limitations, but see, there's some cross grain reinforcement here. And what that's doing is, it's meaning that this crack isn't as big a deal as the fact that we are losing some of the cross grain reinforcement, this little gap here. That's the thing to go treat, and then we can just seal up this crack with some glue. Not a big deal, doesn't super affect the action once that's repaired. The big deal is this crack right along here, uh, right inside that right side. You can probably, if I flex on it, you can probably start to see this guy opening up. I don't know how much detail I'm getting out of this camera, but you'll have to trust me. There's a crack that goes all the way through this wood. These two halves are now separated. And what this wood does in this particular gun is that when our barrel comes back forward, it impacts here. And that's blowing this apart slowly. That'll happen. We don't want it to actually fail, though, and blow wood everywhere. We don't want to lose the detent that sits right here that helps sort of secure everything. The threading's already coming loose. This thing's escaping. This needs major repair. I'm gonna have to go in here. I'm going to have to glue it up at the minimum. I'm probably gonna have to drop in a wood dog bone. This gun is not what I would consider safe to shoot, even though at a cursory glance, it is nearly mint on the outside. This is the sort of thing that you really wanna watch out for. This is what's gonna get you is something hiding up under the wood line like this. And this is why you take your guns apart and get a good look at them before you go out and shoot them. Mm -hmm. Because even if this didn't blow apart in my hand and give me splinters or maybe a, a laceration or something, let's say I had no injuries sustained because it's not a huge time bomb. It's more of a slow crack. The other thing that's gonna happen is this is just gonna blow this handguard apart and then I'm gonna have to try to source and fit another mm -hmm. handguard specific to this model and it'll never be correct, whereas this one's serial matched. So if I take a little time to inspect, I can avoid a disaster, glue this up, I'll have this gun up and running with one Saturday afternoon of tinkering and we'll be ready to go because I took this time to look. Mm -hmm. Now, all of the stuff we've talked about here applies to handguns as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just long guns, it's, it's all universally appropriate. Yes. Can you think of anything that's really particular, though? Uh, yeah, I mean, depending on the type of gun and the mechanism, there are some uh, checks you have to do that you wouldn't have to do with other stuff. Uh, and I can think of a big one. You oh, yeah. Me? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. What kind of thing one. is this, Bruno? It's a revolver. Come yeah, on. It's a spinny boy. Yes. So this is a rare and interesting revolver, mm -hmm. but the biggest thing that you need to understand about revolvers, put this guy back on the thing, is actually, you know what? I think we have a better revolver for this. Might Ooh, be a better. Oh, yeah. This might be a better example. This is a little more useful for what we're doing. Mm. So let me get this in here. Okay, we got top break. And what the top break allows me to do is to show you that we have six of these cylinders in one barrel and they must enter alignment. Now I know I'm out of my uh, depth of field right there, but you guys can see cylinder, barrel, cylinder, barrel, cylinder, barrel. It's a little hazy, that's fine. Uh, all you need to know is that if the timing on this gun is off, if this gun, you know where you can see it, if this cylinder rotates and stops 25% out of alignment with that bore, we're gonna get something bad, aren't we? Oh yeah, yeah. We were actually on the receiving end of something like that a long time ago because yeah. we uh, didn't check that much and we thought, ah, oh, they're probably fine. And then we went to shoot some revolvers and when you have a cylinder that's slightly out of alignment and you shoot a bullet, it's part of it's gonna get shaved and that's gonna go flying out perpendicular and it doesn't care what it hits. Yeah, it's not fun for your friends that are beside no, you. No, it doesn't feel good. No, uh, and shavings, a problem on yeah. a lead bullet. It's not that huge. Like it's not supremely dangerous no, for eyes and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, pretty soft metal, but still, you get you get healed way over there. You start getting that 25, 30 percent range, mm -hmm. and you can have actual blow apart failures. Yeah, like misaligned, just far. Now, generally, the width of the primer helps avoid the worst of those. Yeah, but still, mm. if you if you if you're shooting a revolver or you shoot it and you notice that it's shaving. You stop and you fix that because it will get worse. Yes. So I'm going to tell you all a trick for this real quick. Mm. I want to be very, very <laughs> clear yes, because I'm advocating something that you need to know 100% yeah. what you are doing. Mm. This thing has to be dead empty. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you sadly have to close it up and you it's, must look down the bore with a flashlight at the rear. Scary, but yeah. And you have to index the revolver and watch for the cylinder to come around and yeah, line up. How well it lines up. Perfectly. Mm -hmm. And then come around and line up perfectly. Mm -hmm. Is there some slop allowed in order to be able to shoot one of these? Yes. Yes. If you do not understand this process and you're learning it from me by watching this video, yeah, uh, <laughs> you don't know what those tolerances are. No. Talk to a gunsmith, develop mm -hmm. this skill on your own. Mm -hmm. But yes, the proper way to be able to check this, the only real way to be able to see it is to actually shine a flashlight at the back of the cylinder mm -hmm. and see. watch them come into alignment. Yep. And you want perfect circle on top of perfect circle. Um, yeah. And I, the process is scary as heck to look uh, at, yeah. but it is, is the way it. to see it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's another one of those four rules things that gets a little wacky. Mm -hmm. uh, revolvers, I think, are one of those guns that is the most susceptible to getting people hurt. Yes. Because they don't understand how they work. Mm -hmm. They think they are simple and somehow invulnerable. Yeah. Oh, well, we're on that subject then, attention. Uh, if somebody hands you a revolver, or if you've inherited one, don't cowboy it. By that I mean don't, especially if it's a swing-out cylinder, don't slam Ooh, it yeah. shut. With a top brake, don't go like that and have the weight of it close the latch, because you will start bending, and you will break stuff, and you will put things out of alignment without noticing or meaning to, or you will break off the little bit of the trigger that holds the cylinder in place, and now you've made a gun that was previously perfectly fine, uh, not so much. Yeah, we have not actually had a single top break revolver come into our show that we have not had to retime. Oh yeah. Because with the top break specifically, it's mm -hmm. just so fun to walk, oh, only yeah. much harder than I'm doing it so it yeah. actually closes. And they start to yield, and then the other thing is to slap it open yes. so hard that you start to get bend, bend yeah. in this direction. Mm -hmm. and. It, it adds. Oh, yeah. And then and also on top breaks specifically, as you shoot them, they start to beat I was going to say, yeah, up. even if nobody necessarily treats the gun roughly over time, if it's shot, it's just it's slowly going to walk out of tolerance. It's just, you know, it's yeah. wear. Being shot is pretty traumatic for a gun. Now, they're designed mm -hmm. to be reinforced for that, mm -hmm. but... They have a lifespan. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing lasts forever. Mm -hmm. So take it easy mm -hmm. so i think we covered stuff right we got the uh especially paying attention to the board because the board is going to be the thing that tells you the most about the the way the gun's been treated mm -hmm. uh you want to be clear that the chamber is clear mm -hmm. um you may run into like let's say if you have grit and stuff in the chamber if you have pock marks in the chamber you're not going to be able to extract very well yeah you might have extraction problems mm -hmm. uh and then 
uh, from there, you want to make sure that your guns lock if they're supposed to lock. Mm -hmm. If they're a revolving mechanism, you want to make sure that they are in time. Mm -hmm. If they're an unlocked breach, it is very critical to make sure that that breach is halted. So these YOLO Rs, mm -hmm. they're unlocked breaches. You want to make sure that that breach is going to stop when it comes to the rear. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only a handful of guns that don't have that sort of protection, but when you're dealing with historical arms, sometimes there's a reason they were lost to history. Yes. Because they had bad design. Mm -hmm. Understand what you're shooting before you're shooting it. Do not just take it for granted and take it out. What ammunition should I use? All right, so our gun, and we're meandering a bit, but our gun is secure. Yes, we know it's in good working order. This is our gun. Mm -hmm. Sure. Grips are tight, mm -hmm. nothing's cracked, yeah. metal's good. Some cycles nicely, no, okay. no grittiness, nothing weird. Okay, so the gun's fine. Right. Okay. So we can go back to what we're talking about. This says nine millimeter. It does say nine millimeter. It is there. a nine millimeter. Yes. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get my Hornady critical defense. Uh-huh. Super hot load. I'm gonna drop this right in here. We're gonna rock and roll, right? Right. Except no. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I know it says nine millimeter. I went to the goddamn store. I know. And I said nine, nine millimeter, millimeter. And they gave and me And then I said it was for a handgun. Right. And they said, here you go. And I asked if they had any other nine millimeter handgun ammo. Mm-hmm. And they said, this is it. This is all they have. Okay. Okay, so well, I'm ready to rock and roll. Mm -hmm. This is good. Yeah, yeah, should be fine. We're going to blow this, shoot this, and everything will be good. Yeah, why not? Well. Okay. <laughs> not quite. Uh, uh, well, what are you doing? Well, this is a peculiar example, which is part of the reason we brought uh, these guns here. But uh, it says 9mm, but uh, they really should have stamped an extra piece there, because it's actually 9mm Largo, uh, which is 9 by 23 millimeters, whereas that is 9 by 19 Okay, so if I get 9mm Largo, I can shoot this gun. Uh, you're getting closer. Well, you said it's 9mm Largo. Right. But uh, you gotta make sure it's the right kind and the gun can uh, handle it. Right. But if I get the right kind, I can <laughs> shoot this gun. Yes. Okay. And I can shoot this gun. Because this is also a Jolo R, and right. it also it says 9mm millimeter on, on there. there. Right, so clearly it must be 9mm Largo, as it is established, except no. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, that would be too easy. What do I put in this? Well, it is 9mm. Okay. But it's 9mm short, also known as 380. I quit. I want a new gun. I know. Okay, so what are we getting <laughs> into here? Because there's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruno, mm -hmm. components of a cartridge. Uh, so you have four pieces. You have the bullet in front. That's the danger bean. Yes. You have the case, usually brass, that That's contains... like a burrito. Contains so all the that pieces. That would be the fajita. Inside you have... Wait, what are those called? Mm -hmm. Tortilla. Tortillas? Okay, tortilla. My <laughs> flawless understanding of Mexican food. Very much. Okay, Inside, so the bullet is the meat. Yeah, huh, sure. The casing is the... Wrapping. Fajita. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah wait, the, the tortilla, tortilla around it. Okay. Inside you have the gunpowder. In this case, usually smokeless and modern ammunition. What's that? Is that the taco sauce? Sure. Okay. The filling, that's the good stuff inside. Uh -huh. so, and then you have a primer at the back that makes the whole thing go boom. I feel like I've lost the analogy here. Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to keep up. But. Okay. So, <laughs> but. Uh, we have all these components. Right. Probably the least volatile of them in the sense of whether it works or doesn't work is the primer. Mm -hmm. Because either we have a center fire or we have a rim fire. Uh -huh. Or some weird cockamamie pin fire or something, at which point, good luck. Yeah, that's a whole other if story. If you can manage to get yourself into trouble with a pin fire, congratulations. Uh, yes. Um, but generally, we're talking about rim fire versus center fire. Sure. Um, and that's really it. So that's mm -hmm. not a huge confusing point for people. No. Uh, then we get into the bullet. Right. So what's going on there? So, yeah. So the bullet is can be kind of misleading, okay. uh, especially in measurements, because as we said, for example, in this case, nine millimeter, there are a lot, there are a lot of nine millimeter diameter bullets out there, and they are not all equal at all. Okay, so it doesn't mean, nine, nine millimeter Largo, nine millimeter Parabellum, 380, mm -hmm. they may or may not have exactly nine millimeters in diameter. No, they can actually vary. A lot of times designations kind of round numbers or, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, or they can, and then it comes down to powder load, but that's another thing. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a good example of this would be the difference between uh, German 792 by 57, which is what this gun is chambered in. Mm -hmm. So we got a Gewehr 98, right? right? So if this is chambered in 792 by 57, mm -hmm. then as long as that cartridge is that and the bullet diameter is, it just says 792 on it, mm -hmm. I'm good to go. 
Uh, you think so? So the the first version of this gun and also its predecessor, the Gewehr 88, mm -hmm. were chambered in 7x57 in what's called the 88 cartridge, mm -hmm. which was a round nosed, I believe 318, but don't hold me to that because I'm not a hand loader. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they switched to Spitzer, they, went they bumped it up a little bit. Right. And they still call it 792. But it's technically, it's technically a little yeah. bigger. And you think, eh, what's a little, what's a few thousand here and there, no big deal, except when it, you're dealing with this much pressure and force, that, that can be a big difference. So disregarding the pressure, mm -hmm. you're gonna put excessive wear on the barrel. Oh yeah, if you, if you squeeze a bullet that is too big for the rifling, the actual diameter inside that barrel, right. yeah, you're gonna big a lot of friction. So the Gewehr 98 in particular, you can feed an oversized cartridge. So if this was not converted to Spitzer and you put a Spitzer cartridge in here, it'll shoot them all day. Oh yeah. It's gonna fry that bit. Oh yeah, you're gonna ruin it. You're not gonna get hurt. No, no. Ever, because it can handle, this gun, not any gun, mm -hmm. this gun this can handle. This particular design, yeah. Oh, it'll eat it up, but yeah, you're gonna wreck that, yep. the inside of that gun. So, uh, what is a gun? I can think of a gun that does not like overboard ammunition. That's the Carcano. Mm, uh, yes. I see a lot of blown Carcanos, yeah. and there used to be a thing. There used to be a thing where people would- Yeah, this would... is kind of the reason they got a lot of bad rep, I think, yeah. partly. And it's because uh, because of the type of 6.5 that it is, <laughs> there's a very close commercially available cartridge or bullet that people will hand load for, yeah. and they will smoke that gun mm -hmm. because it can't. It just it's it drives partly up the barrel, doesn't necessarily escape the barrel, or even if it does escape the barrel, it leaves so much pressure in its wake that it starts blowing that action out. Yeah, that's not good. So first and foremost, you want to make sure that you actually do know the diameter of your bullet. Mm -hmm. How do we figure that out? Well, we can uh, get some some soft materials and we can slug the barrel. So silly putty. Uh, maybe a little harder than that. <laughs> Double silly putty. That should do it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this should be fine. Uh, generally, actually, if you're going to throw a bullet down the barrel, um, there are jacketed bullets and things like that there, but when we think of them, traditionally, they're lead. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get lead that's slightly over the diameter of your barrel and then pack it down your barrel, preferably with a softer metal rod like brass that's not going to yeah. tear up your barrel, yeah, or a wood dowel if it'll fit and not split, that's, that's uh, you can bang a piece of lead down yeah. your barrel. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's actually very simple to do. Mm -hmm. And when it comes out, you're going to want to take a pair of calipers and be very clear about the two readings that are going to be on that bullet. Mm -hmm. The inside and the outside, if it's rifle. Yes. Uh, if it's a shotgun, we're not talking about that's, this. Actually, shotguns don't worry about. It's a whole. Other that's a whole game. other kettle of fish. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, unless you're firing a slug out of a shotgun, your choke's going to be what your choke is. Mm -hmm. uh, don't sweat that so much. Um, but with rifled barrels, yeah, we're going to take a slug and we're going to understand what our barreling is. Um, unless it's a very clearly understood gun. So mm -hmm. there are guns that people understand very well. 1911. Sure. Chambered in 45 almost every time. Pretty much. Some exceptions, but you would notice pretty quickly. Yeah, you can tell. And that barrel diameter is going to be what it is because that cartridge does not change over the life of that gun. Nope. If you inherit a US 1911, you are very sure of what you're getting for barrel diameter. Mm -hmm. Jolo ours, apparently. <laughs> uh, yeah, German they, Mausers, they, uh, apparently. Yeah, they fluctuate. There's some changes in there. So mm -hmm. be careful. Yes. Okay, so we cleared bullet. Mm -hmm. We cleared primer. Mm -hmm. We got. Two more to go. Right. Let's talk about case. Okay. So, um, if I can get a cartridge, like, so what, what is this? is Largo, 9x23? Yeah. Yes, 9x23. Okay, so if I can get it to fit a 9x19, like, I can get it in there, mm -hmm. and let's assume the, everything else is equal because we're getting to powder in a minute, that'll be fine. Mm. Just that case length being shorter, as long as I can get the extractor to sort of hold it up hold against the breech face. Should be good. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, actually. Okay. It's probably one of the more scary things I think can happen is if you have a, a case that is smaller uh, or shorter, uh, you don't want anything loose in there. <laughs> yeah. So you can get two things that can happen. One is the case is allowed too far forward and mm -hmm. the, the somehow the firing pin still manages to detonate it. Yeah. And then it pistons, it has room yeah. so to- It's not being supported, yeah. So it has room to move back. Kind of like that Kill Bill moment where she's like punching the yeah. top of the thing, only really it can work up a good punch. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that can happen is it could stay with the breech face so that it doesn't piston, mm -hmm. uh, but instead, 
what happens is when it detonates, it has room to go forward. Forward, yeah. And when it goes forward, it can tear up the chamber some, yes. but what's really gonna happen is it's gonna, on certain guns especially, it is gonna tear the crap out of the extractor. Yes. Uh, and it's not gonna function properly. No, yeah, you, odds are you might get it wedged in there, you're not gonna be able yeah. to get it out, it's a mess. So um, a common one for this is Webley self-loading pistols, 455 yeah. Webley, mm -hmm. semi-automatic. Sure. Uh, weirdly, you can fit 45 ACP hollow points in there. Yes. And they will fire. Oh yeah. And It'll it go. will beat your extractor to mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. So don't do it. Don't do yeah. it. Um, fragile part. I, I just want to make, I know I'm giving all these weird cases that people are going to go out and Yeah, get. they seem like edge cases, yeah. but, you know. But I want you to understand how many of these stepping stones, or tripping stones there can be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got case. Yes. We're down to powder. Mm. Can you think of a notorious example of powder? Because <laughs> I can think of one very clearly, uh, and it has to do with, again, our, our 9 by 19 Yeah, yeah, good old, uh, good old 9 parabellum. Yeah. Um, so, uh, first of all, not everything is 9 parabellum because, no. uh, don't take it for granted, guys. This cartridge came out around 1908 with the Luger PO8. Yeah, it's pretty old. And then it took time to become popular. Yeah, now it's ubiquitous. But right. back in the day, it was just another well, it was, cartridge. It was a Luger cartridge. Right. And eventually it was a C96 cartridge. Right. And then eventually it got added to other guns. Mm -hmm. And then it became more and more popular. But sure. it took decades for this to take over the market. Mm -hmm. So don't count on everything being 9mm Parabellum. Right. But even within that, mm. let's talk about 9 by 19 Mm. Because I know a gun that can chamber this exactly, yes. perfectly. Yeah, no the, gaps. The, 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 the bullet, perfect. The mm -hmm. primer, perfect. The case, perfect. Mm. So it should be good. Yeah. Mm, except no. <laughs> what gun are we talking about, Bruno? Probably, Part yeah. of your heritage, I'm oh. sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, indirectly. Um, we have uh, a Glacenti. <laughs> <laughs> 9mm Glacenti, which is identical dimensionally to 9mm Parabellum. As a matter of fact, feet per second, it's not that far off. No, Only it's actually hundred. quite close, yeah. However, if you put 9mm Parabellum in a Glacenti pistol and start firing it, you, <laughs> you will have a bad day. I mean, maybe not instantly. No. But the gun's gonna have a bad day. But I almost guarantee you, if some the previous owner did not know about that either, and he just said, hey, I got some 9mm Parabellum, hey look, it fits, no big deal, and fired hundreds of rounds, and now you have it, and you do the same thing, that might be the day this has to give out. If this seems like insanely bad luck, it's not. Um, mm. And I want to be very clear about this because this is a this is a again another edge case, but it's the sort of thing you need to be aware of when you deal with old firearms. Mm -hmm. All sorts of crazy stuff happened at the turn of the century. Oh yeah. And what happened in this situation is you have a man Ravelli who's in charge of selecting new guns. He's part of the group that's in charge committee, of selecting yes. a committee to bring in new guns for the Italian army. Mm -hmm. And they have a handgun trial, mm -hmm. and he has designed a handgun, but he does not want them to know that because he cannot, therefore, it's a advise. Of, it's yeah. a conflict of interest. It's not a good look. Yeah. So he licenses that out to a company. Mm -hmm. That company produces it, doesn't mention Hush. his name, yes. submits it to army trials. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, wow, everybody, look at a surprising new handgun that's so that good. That I've never seen before. It looks great. It's in a proprietary cartridge. Mm -hmm. And they get through most of the trials. It's adopted technically. Yep. And then at the 11th hour, the government goes, hey, the Germans have this cool 9 millimeter Parabellum yeah, cartridge. looks kind of promising. Uh, any way you can uh, you know, retrofit it into this gun should be, a, you know, should be no problem, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Glacenti can't handle the pressure of was, the 9mm Parabellum. It was not, not designed for it. Yeah. Right. But he couldn't say no because then... Well, yeah, you lose out on a lot of money. That's, yeah, not a good luck. So he said, yeah, sure, we can... It uh, can chamber 9 yeah. by 9. Millimeter. millimeter, which is technically correct, the best kind of correct. Right. <laughs> However, we're just gonna leave a little room in that case. And yeah. Download not, that. Not tell anybody. Not like they're gonna know any difference. It'll yeah. Be fine. So that's how nine millimeter Glacenti was born, and mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that history can do just to mess with you. Mm -hmm. So there's other things that can happen on a more individual basis. People rechamber things. People. Work oh up, yeah, all know. the time. So be careful. Mm -hmm. um, don't trust the gun inherently. Now, if we did all our history lesson mm -hmm. and we're worried about somebody wildcatting with it, so taking a gun yeah. and just converting it into some random cartridge. Sometimes some people weird. invented their own. It's a, oh, yeah, it's yeah. a cartridge that it's only a, exists. It's a whole little his, community, yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. How can we be absolutely certain of what our chamber is? Well, we can uh, cast it. Okay, uh, what kind of process would you say that is? Easy, hard? I mean, 
Well, I might not be the right person to ask. I, I don't. I've seen it done, so I know how it is. But it's if you're an average kind of you know gun owner, it's probably maybe a little up there. So if you want to cast your chamber, you're going to need to buy special material, heat it up. It's a type of liquidable metal. Yes. Uh, soft metal. Yeah. So you need to heat the stuff up, Sarah safe. Which is now kind of dangerous. Yep. You want to be careful. Wear some gloves. Yep. You're gonna have. Uh, you're gonna have to plug your bore. Yep. Pour this into your gun, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have to let it cool, extract that, and you're mm. going to have to knowledgeably measure that. Mm. And if that sounds super simple, yeah. congratulations, you could probably pull it off, but I'm gonna tell you the measurement's weirder than you think. Mm -hmm. Because you can have healed bullets, yeah. you can have set in bullets, mm -hmm. you can have straight walls and- All sorts of you things, know, you yeah. can have, all kinds of shapes. Yeah, yeah, there's all shapes of chambers, mm -hmm. and some of them will trick you. Oh yeah. So, if you would like to get into that kind of hobby and understand it, I highly recommend it because it's not that hard to do. Mm -hmm. But it again, when you go to measure, requires a lot of historical context. Mm -hmm. A lot of sources, yeah. Cartridge books or right. diagrams. And then I would also have a gunsmith check. I would, just, I would find yeah, somebody knowledgeable to a, check behind you. Get a second opinion, yeah. For the first couple. And don't tell them what you think it is. Just give them the, give them the data and be like, what do you think you this is? You write down your answer, you get his answer back, and if they're the same a couple times in a row, you're probably doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I just want people to be aware, it, chamber casting is not magic. No. It can still lead to false positives or negatives. Yes. Because of the way some of these chambers can get yeah. on top of Yeah, or if you chamber. measure stuff that's a little bit off and you're like, ah, it's close enough, I'll round it. Yeah. Mm. Revolvers can be bad about this mm -hmm. because revolvers can be set up so that the chambers are just sort of open yeah. for yeah. whatever length. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually get a case read Yeah, you don't them. know how long it's supposed to be. And then now you just need to know whether or not that, that revolver is pressure rated for that cartridge. Mm -hmm. So tricky. Yeah, our homework. Um, when we're talking about this stuff, by the way, when I say pressure rating, um, I want to make sure that you guys understand if you go into hand loading at all, or if you deal with someone who offers to hand load ammo for you, mm -hmm. there's an assumption that, oh, I'll have them reduce, I'll cut the powder in half because mm -hmm. it's a nice round number. Mm -hmm. Would you advise cutting the powder load in half? Mm, no. The shorter the barrel, the safer that is to do, mm -hmm. but there is a condition in which you have so little powder that you actually over pressurize the gun. Mm -hmm. How does that happen, Bruno? Your danger beam mm -hmm. doesn't make it all the way out. Ah, uh, yeah, gets stuck. I think the, the, the highly technical term is a squib, I yes. believe. Yeah. So what's happened is you have a rifle like this is usually how it happens. It's not as common in handguns, but it mm -hmm. does happen. Mm -hmm. Is that you have a half load because you want to be extra safe and not blow it up. Right, yeah. But the half load doesn't have enough power to, to deliver the bullet all, all the way, way out. out. Yeah, and it gets stuck somewhere in here. Right. Yeah. And when it gets stuck, the gas that's supposed to be able to vent out the barrel, even though it's reduced, mm -hmm. can't. Right. And so it builds, but doesn't build enough to blow it out, mm -hmm. and you can get a lot of reaction at the rear too. Yep. And even if that doesn't happen, yeah, you might you... extract that. Right, and you think, oh, okay, one. yeah. Uh, and you think everything's fine, yeah. And now you have an obstructed bore. Right. You have another bullet ready to go. You fire that, You it hits that. Hard, hard, really wall, hard locks, and now suddenly it's like a you know, yeah. you know Acme cartoon Wiley e. Coyote kind of you know that exploding banana barrel. It's really not fun. Blow up again. Yeah, uh, a point on that: uh, if you are testing, when you're going to go shoot this thing, you really want to make sure you have a paper target behind to make sure that when you're firing it, you're actually poking holes. The bullet is leaving the chamber, and you have. Don't have any squibs. Now hold on, because uh, we're not quite to firing it yet. I want to give that advice a little bit later. Uh, before we take it out, mm. we're going to have to deal with this next question. Yes. How do I clean this? So a good firearms inspection includes a good firearms cleaning Ooh. before you shoot it. Yeah, I know. Can you think of some problems that can be caused by poor cleaning? Yeah, well, a lot of times you have guns that are really dirty on the inside. And they might look nice on the outside, but inside is just a gooey mess, right. uh, and that creates a lot of, uh, it can be friction, it doesn't let parts slide as well as they should, it just things jam together, it's uh, sticky, it's not good. Yeah, so the best case scenario, the gun doesn't work right. The worst mm -hmm. case scenario is you end up with some accidents. So mm -hmm. a good example of this is like gunk sticking up like an interrupter or something and you get a runaway. Like mm -hmm. a good one's like a firing pin. If you have a mm -hmm. firing pin that for whatever reason gets rusted up or gunked up, uh -huh. And then you pull the trigger, the firing pin hits the primer, yeah. 
right. and then sticks. Mm, and so then it comes yeah. back, it feeds the next round, and suddenly you've got a handgun submachine gun or rifle yeah, or whatever. It just runs away from you. And you're and not, it sounds, some of you are thinking, oh, it sounds red. Uh, not if you're not expecting you it. You like go to trigger and it still happens yeah, and you're not expecting it and you're, mm -mm. no, no, Ooh. it's not good. Okay. Um, so that's a, that's a good example of like bad cleaning. Sure. Um, there's other stuff that can happen. Uh, if you've got a bunch of grease packed in there mm -hmm. and it's like a semi-auto of some sort and you fire it and it's not meant to compress grease. Yeah. You can get some damage to the You suddenly have a hydraulic so, yeah, yeah. The system that's not meant to be there and yeah, you can you can bend some stuff. It's yeah. no fun. Cosmoline can be bad in certain systems oh, if it man, gets really yeah. compressed. Uh, yeah, especially sometimes you get guns that have been found in like uh, old armories and stuff like that and they were packed, you know, who knows, 60 years ago and they were like, well, they're gonna be here for a while so we're gonna cover the insides and this gross, like, grease kind of things to make sure they don't rust, which is good. However, when you get it, uh, not so fun. I've I've seen some revolvers that are so slicked inside full of grease that you try and, you know, cock it to go into single action, and the hammer will just slip, yeah. you know, and you're like, that's not good. So the first thing you're going to do is understand how to take apart the mm -hmm. firearm that you have. Yes. Uh, for that, you're going to want, I want to be very clear, you want hollow ground gunsmithing screwdrivers. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you don't want to force anything to the point mm. that you strip the head. That's the worst case yeah. scenario. Yep. Don't damage and scratch up guns mm -hmm. because you're in a hurry. Yeah. You want to take a screwdriver, you want to find the bit that fits the slot perfectly. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is most Americans especially are used to having screwdrivers that are tapered mm -hmm. so that they walk out under certain torque loads so it controls the amount of torque that's going into the system. Right. Guns are not set up that way. No. They have perfectly square slots. Yep. And the screwdrivers must also be squared. So that they sit down in there and the torquing power comes from the bottom corners mm -hmm. of that screwdriver. Yes. And it turns evenly across the whole thing. If you really can't get a screw moving, like honestly, a lot of times when guns are filthy, mm -hmm. you need to take a, like a plastic toothpick yeah. and scratch the the. Yes, you wouldn't gunk. think so. But yeah, if, if there's gunk, uh, you know, taking up space there, you, you won't be able to get a good fit. Right. So get in there and clean out the slot, mm -hmm. put the screwdriver in, then turn. Yeah. And I would recommend, you know, don't just all of a sudden just jam it. Just slowly creep up on it. And if you if you feel kind of, if you hit a wall, don't keep going necessarily. Back off a little bit. Try, you know, these yeah. short kind of sort of oscillating movement to see don't if you can. Don't tear the head off. No. Use penetrating oil. If like, it's really seized in there, yeah. If you can see it's kind of rusted, you know, you might need to let it soak in there and kind of loosen up. God knows how many years of rust and, and gunk to finally crack it loose. There are other, by the way, there's a variety of penetrating oils. Yes. Um, I've gotten by with Croil just fine. Yeah, um, Croil's good. There's other stuff out there. The problem is I don't know how to fix finish, so yeah. beware. Mm -hmm. um, but penetrating oils are very good things to have. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you, gotta, you guys got to be patient. Like, yeah. if I'm being honest, putting the gun somewhere where it's going to get warm, just mm -hmm. warm, mm -hmm. with penetrating oil on it, so oh, yeah, that can do... Not an oven. No. You know, no. Like a sunbeam. Yeah, you know maybe what I mean? like, or just maybe like a really old light bulb that throws a lot of heat out. Just yeah. kind of let it... You let know. it get warm. Mm -hmm. Not incendiary point. No. Not melting plastic warm. Nope. Let it get warm with some penetrating oil on it. Let mm -hmm. it sit for a day. Let it sit for two days and keep adding penetrating oil. I like to take a plastic punch and mm -hmm. tap it mm -hmm. and just let that Bad. penetrating oil get in there and do its thing. Yeah. Patience is key to preserving these pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, once you can get the screws open, then you can get the gun apart, mm -hmm. whatever the gun may be, however it comes apart, make sure you understand. Yeah. Uh, once you're in there, now it's time to actually do some cleaning. Mm -hmm. So let me recommend a product that I enjoy, but you can go with whatever you think is best. Sure. Oh boy, the green cans, and I'm probably a little too high for my point of focus, but this stuff should say Ballistol. Uh, there's other brands, there's other lubricants, there's other cleaners, blah, blah, blah. I like Ballistol okay because it does a good job of like cleaning and lubricating, and it doesn't seem to mm -hmm. tear anything up. I will say the one downside to this product is it stinks. Yeah, it's not a very nice smell. Uh, get a fan out. Don't accidentally like huff this stuff. It is a little yeah. painful to deal with. Yeah. Uh, I got two versions here because generally I use the aerosol can for getting in there and cleaning stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there are other harsher ways to get in there and clean if you're really stuck, but sure. I'm going to be honest with you. This and a rag will take care of most things, mm -hmm. and when that doesn't work, I honestly will reach for, hold on, let me get this out, a toothbrush mm -hmm. to get in there and sort of, actually this is a really white rag, I'm going to move that for a second. 
Toothbrush is great, beat on it all you like. And then if you really got stuff deep down in there sure. and it's really in the corners and it's causing gritty yeah, feel. Yeah, you can't really get to it. Brass pick. Yeah, or sometimes as I said, like some dentist tools. Yeah, those. those are usually steel. Yeah, um, true, we'll kind of scratch up. Uh, definitely preferably brass. I rarely use the sharp side of this. I quite frequently use this paddle side that's nice and rounded because it doesn't yeah. tear anything up. Yeah, you can just kind of scoop it out. Slowly. And it's softer mm -hmm. than the steel, and generally the inside of mechanisms are not blued or finished. No. Nope. So you can get it, I would not use this on the outside, because even though it's softer than the steel, you can still it's scratch. harder than the finish, mm -hmm. and you can still scratch it up. But where it's inside, where things are in the white, it should be good. It's fine. It's, mm -hmm. it's softer than the steel. So brass pick, toothbrush. With the toothbrush, um, toothpaste. As long as it's not fancy stuff, just some baking yeah, soda toothpaste. Yeah, no, it sounds funny, but yeah, it, it works. The hard part about baking soda toothpaste is that you don't use toothpaste in your action unless you are going to take it out of the wood or there's no wood around. Right because you're going to need to rinse it out with warm water. Mm. And then you're gonna to have to dry it out and mm. then you're gonna to have to lubricate it. So you can use toothpaste and it works really well, mm -hmm. but you gotta rinse it back out just like you rinse your mouth out. Mm -hmm. It sticks everywhere. You can't use toothpaste and then say nuts to it and Oof. just put it back in. Yeah. So uh, if you have a lot of cosmoline in the action, you can heat it up. Mm -hmm. I've seen people take the metal parts and put them in the oven. Yeah. Uh, at lower temperatures. Yes, yes, yeah, I've seen <laughs> Uh, I've seen a more a little more brutish way of sometimes people will start shooting their old guns and the cost molino starts to sweat out of as the it woods. Heats up. Yeah. I don't recommend doing that as a way to get it out, but you know. Oil and wood is very tricky. Yes. There's no one right answer for oil and wood. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, generally you want to sweat it out. It's kind of but if you over bake it, you're gonna ruin the wood. Yes. So mm. Mm. that's a different topic. Yeah, nightmarish. Mm -hmm. Um but generally we think of the metal. Uh, the mm -hmm. wood is either good or not when we think in terms of getting ready to shoot a gun. Yeah. If the wood is soft and rotty and ruined or over oiled or cracking, we already took care of that inspection. Yeah. And cleaning isn't going to fix that. No, it's kind of already gone. Yeah. Um, okay, so mm -hmm. we've inspected our gun. It looks good. Yes. We've scrubbed it out now. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to get into the bore specifically. Mm. When it comes to bore tools, the yes. yeah, number one thing you're going to need is a brush, either brass or nylon. I tend to prefer nylon because I tend to beat up my brass brushes. Yes. Uh, right. Once you have that clear, with the, or once you have it worked loose, the brush isn't really cleaning it. The brush is knocking everything loose. Yep. And then you're going to follow that with a, well, you're going to follow it with a patch. It's just going to be some, I use old t-shirts that are cut up, mm -hmm. but you can get cotton ones that are dedicated. Yeah, you, you get, get little whatever. discs, yeah. You get mm -hmm. these, pa you get patches. Mm -hmm. uh, you can feed the patch using either a jag or a loop. Uh, I have become a jag man over time, mm -hmm. but usually the kits come with loops. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, the important awesome. thing on both of these though, don't pack this stuff in there. Oh yeah, I did that in my early days before I knew any better. Yeah. Right, and you can get stuff stuck. Oh yeah. With this, with, like these need to be cut to the right size. Gently experiment. If you feel like, like yeah. way too much resistance, get out of there. Oh yeah. Uh, it's gonna be really hard. Yeah, you want just enough that it'll grab all the stuff you knocked loose and it'll just sweep with by with it basically. Now, how do we use these things? Uh, well, you're gonna need uh, some sort of rod. Uh, well, yeah, you, well, or, or if you, or if you're you, because you want to be special. And Some different. sort of rod, you say? Uh, yes. Like this, right? Uh, well, yeah. First glance, no. However, no. You're gonna want a nice and rigid. Watch your eye. The cleaning rod. In yes. this case, I happen to have a weird old Super West cool German, West German, yeah, yeah fancy one. But, uh, but straight rods. As cool as the segmented piece is, mm. uh, most of the times you get them in kits and they screw together. Yeah, honestly, I I would just say from experience because I've bought, I think I went through like three or four of those. Get a, a nice solid one that's you know the right diameter to fit inside the barrel. This thing seems this thing seems pretty cool, but I would actually recommend a solid one as yeah, well. Yeah, it's just it's just less of a hassle because I've broken so many of those ones that screw together. Yeah, when possible, work from the rear, from the chamber side, so you don't tear up the muzzle. Yeah. If also, you, ideally, you don't if if you have a really filthy barrel, you don't want to be shoving all that gunk into the action because then you got to clean it out of there. So. Right. Just saves, um, it, saves but you some time. If you do need to come from the back, hold on, I dropped my stuff. Hmm. If you need to come from the back, or from the front rather, and work through the muzzle side, you can just mm -hmm. do not gouge up the crown, which is yes. that last little bit of rifling and that, that taper, that reverse taper that comes back down in. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the last bit of rifling is the most critical. If you're going to scratch a gun up, you could you can dig a furrow into the rifling midway in the barrel, hardly affect accuracy. Sure. But you well, put a nick in the crown, and, yeah. and, well not the crown, but a nick in that last little bit of the muzzle. And it can really affect, yeah, trajectory. Yeah. yeah. So be careful at the muzzle end of the gun. Yeah, and honestly, part of it is just take your time. It's not not a race. Yeah, you don't want to. You really don't want to leave any marks on the gun. You're just trying to clean it and get it nice and clean so that it operates the way it should. Yep, and then uh, if you got a lot of filth in there, I'm gonna come back over here. I kind of like these guys, squeegees. They're mm. not available for every caliber yet. No. I think these sure. are Remington's product, but these yeah. are really good at pushing yes. muck out. Yeah, they're nice and soft too, I like them. And then you have mops, and mm. mops are more common with shotguns. Yeah. And I tend to use them to actually just reapply lubricant back down the bore, which is another mm -hmm. thing you want to do. Mm -hmm. You want to re-lubricate the bore when you're done. Yeah, once it's nice and clean, you want yeah, you need a little bit of lube there to help all the pieces slide together. And just to give you a point of advice, on a lot of old guns, you're going to get it where the bore looks really clean, mm -hmm. and yet every time you put a patch there, it's still coming out black. Right. At that point, as long as it's nice and clean, and you're getting some shine, and you're getting some attention back out of it, and you're you're ob it's obvious that you can now see under the grunge enough to know that there's no pitting or no dangerous stuff in there. Mm -hmm. You might want to go shoot it because the bullet's going to sh shove them. It's going to shove <laughs> a bunch a, out and deposit a bunch of new yeah, stuff. Yeah, in a way, uh, it acts as its own kind of squeegee. Yeah. No, 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 no. There's, you, know, you can also have lead build up to the point that the bullet gets compressed and that's no yeah, good. Yeah, sure, yeah. But, but generally, if, you're, if you've done a good job of cleaning and you're just, it's just kind of coming back coffee colored every mm -hmm. time, just go shoot it and then clean it after shooting. Yeah. Um, so that'll get you covered in terms of the prep work for the barrel. Mm -hmm. On the chamber, again, make sure that there's no deformations or grit or gunk in the chamber. If you really want to clean up a chamber without ruining it, mm -hmm. uh, specific to shotguns, I'll find that there's a lot of gunk in the chambers. Mm -hmm. You can take something like an sh oversized shotgun brush, mm -hmm. Uh, like so a 10 gauge shoved into a 12 gauge chamber right. or if you're working with a rifle you can take like a, a 20 gauge shotgun yeah, brush and stick it. it into a 30 out 6 chamber or something mm -hmm. like that nylon I really like for that because it can do that and then come back and go do its regular job right brass gets deformed in there yeah not so much yeah kind of ruin it but um, if you take a nylon brush and hook it up to a power drill and just Ooh, beat the yep. chamber some yep clean it out soft soft material yes. yeah you don't want to scratch not any... steel wool no uh, you can beat a lot of that muck out of there yes. and hopefully bring it back enough that you can then come in with a mop and kind of just clean it up. wipe it out mm -hmm. and bring it out. So there's a couple tricks in there. So mm -hmm. barrel and chamber clear. We've gone through if it's a semi-automatic or any other sort of mechanism that moves. We've picked out all the gunk we can find. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked about lubricating it after it's clean. Right. Um, it varies. Some guns want uh, grease, some yeah, guns want it's, oil. It's more art than science, honestly. Um, I will highly recommend two things. Mm. Right away and for immediate use and not long-term use mm -hmm. is moose milk. Uh, yes. This comes from the Black Powder guys. I picked this up from Black Powder channels because mm -hmm. they work with guns that like to rust like that. Oh, yeah. Highly corrosive powders and things yes. like that. Um, speaking of which, corrosive ammo. Oh yeah, we should probably point that out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially older uh, military ammo, all the surplus stuff you might find if you're trying to shoot an old gun. Uh, the primers deposit uh, sort of particulate that, when combined with a lot of sort of atmospherics, turns into I believe sulfuric acid. Don't quote me on that. But basically, if you shoot corrosive ammo, you want to clean it very soon afterwards because if you leave it, and I am speaking from experience here, you will. Put it away, six months later you open it up and it's just rusted all. Now you gotta do a whole deep clean. Right, so what I'm hearing is you want me to pee down the barrel when I'm done shooting. <laughs> I, maybe, water, maybe should water should probably, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of myths around this, but actually if you wanna think about it, um, water with just a little warm water. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're shooting in a situation where you won't get to clean the guns right away and you've been shooting uh, corrosive, mm -hmm. I would run warm water down the barrel, Yes. blow it out, dry yeah, a little just bit, neutralize it, yeah. and then put it away and you can clean it in a day or so. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want something that's kind of tricky that you can use, uh, car wiper fluid. Yes, actually. Uh, uh, Windex. Yeah, Windex. Those kind of things. Like yeah, they seen, tend to. Yeah, I've seen people with like a tub and they'll just dunk, you know, kind yeah, of. Yeah, for spent cases. Mm -hmm. So uh, brass, like black powder brass, people will dunk into yes, Windex and stuff of, like that. Yeah, kind of halt the process. But um, Windex is a good stuff if you know you're going in a situation where you won't be able to immediately take care of the corrosive agents. Mm -hmm. You can use Windex as a quick cleaner. Yeah, just sort of a, yep. And then you can get to the gun a little mm -hmm. bit later. So be aware of corrosive ammo. Be aware of corrosive people. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah we, uh, I really should look into this. I'm sure somebody's had to have written some sort of 
scientific paper on this, but for whatever reason, <laughs> ginger-haired people uh, just seem to have a touch of death. Uh, if I if I touch this gun, you know, roll my thumb on it, and I come back, not even 24 hours later, there's a big old rust thumbprint on there. That's and not exclusive, by the way. No. Other people can cause no, it. No, other people, but for whatever and reason... if you're Even if you're regular non-ginger beard... Yeah, too. Handling uh, it will do. If that. I put my thumb on it... Sure. And I come back a month from now... Yes. It's going to be on there. Yeah. So human finger oils are caustic to gun finish. Yes, oh, long term. So yeah. take it's, it easy on that. Yeah, especially with some guns, especially some blur, the finish is kind of worn off and it's more raw exposed to metal. That's, you know, I, I know because I've done it so many times with my guns, I, I, it's like I, I can tell how it's going to spread. So, so you actually tend to wear nitrile gloves. Yes. For most of your cleaning. Yeah, A, because if I'm going into old guns, they're probably filthy inside. And I don't want to get it on my hands, but also I don't want to get my hands on it, basically. Oh, so we got down a tangent. I'm sorry. Mm. I want to make sure. Moose milk yes. is, uh, let me get over to the camera. And that is made with ballastol. This is the liquid non aerosolized kind and just water. Yeah. So uh, the mixture is to your discretion. I use a one third as a very strong agent, mm. but you can actually dilute it even further than that. Sure. This does dilute in water. You shake it up. And then honestly, I don't know that I ever have to. I shake it out of habit. I don't even think you have to. I probably. But this comes from the black powder, guys. Uh, what it does is it's a really good job of getting into parts of the metal. Yeah, it flows really well. And then uh, the water component evaporates and it just leaves a layer of ballastol. Mm -hmm. This is not a long term storage Ooh. solution. Nope. Uh, that would be more of a grease or a packing grease. Yes. Because it's not going to flow. Because you rack the gun, all the oil starts to start flowing. Yep. So the least oil part of your gun is the, the one that's fighting gravity. Right. So uh, long-term storage, you got to pack grease in there. Sorry. Yeah. It sucks. Um, so it is. But six months to a year, this stuff's probably fine. Yeah. Um, when we uh, talk about lubricating guns, mm. this is not a lubricant particularly. It helps. No, yeah. Like it says it's, lubricate. It's one of its qualities. Lubricates, yeah. penetrates, protects, preserves. Sure. It does a good job of those things. Yes. But if you have heat and movement in certain parts particularly or parts that are sealed away that are likely to shed their lubricant easily, mm -hmm. I recommend lithium grease. Yes. There's a bunch of products out there. You can honestly go to the automotive store and just get a can of lithium grease. Yeah. It's cheaper. And I was going to say, yeah, I would prefer it if you got it from there. It's definitely going to be more less expensive. Yeah, there's all, I mean, I've seen all sorts of like $30 tubes. Oh, of, God, yeah. It's no, just, it's the same stuff. No, so. go, go get some lithium grease mm -hmm. and it, it'll be fine. Yep. Um, I wouldn't pack it into every gun. Mm -hmm. I would pack it into very specific purposes. Yes. I would not be sitting there sticking it on sear surfaces no. that need to. But, you know, parts that you know are under heat and load. Um, Garens particularly tend to like yes. having lithium grease yeah, in them. Yeah, semi-autos. Yeah. Uh, so that's another product that you can use, mm -hmm. um, but you, you use your own discretion. Don't don't be a dumbass. Yeah. Guy. Also, while we're on the subject of lubricants, WD forty <laughs> is is not, not a lubricant. What's the uh, W? It's a water displacement formula number mm -hmm. forty. I believe it was the fortieth attempt. Yeah. Yeah. It was they made for keeping they didn't even water displace water the thirty nine other times. And no, that's yeah. It was used to keep water off of like nuclear missiles, and it's really good at that. It is not a lubricant. Yeah. Nuclear <laughs> missiles don't need lubricating, to my knowledge. No. They're fairly inert, other than the part where you you'd hope so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Except when they go flying. But, um, yeah. You can tell, by the way, if somebody's. Oh, you put, can, I can smell it from. A you mile can smell away. it, and if you if you ever open an old gun and you kind of have this. You know, it's like a waxy kind of Yeah, it substrate. just feels like everything's just like yeah, slow motion. Yeah, you know, somebody like 40, 50 years ago put some WD-40 in there like, oh, know, it's good. Yeah, to years. be fair, yeah. it's. So the problem with WD-40 is mm. it stays there and displaces the water. Right. But it doesn't displace just dander, people skin. Yeah, it, it sucks hair, everything else up. Mm -hmm. And it just, and it takes on moisture. It, it, yeah, it, it keeps it's, the moisture it's off the gun. gun. But it's a grime magnet, yeah. Yeah, and, and it just, and, and it, it, it becomes... Filmy. Yeah, and it, when you try and parts start to slide past it, it's, it's no good. Which actually why I prefer ballastol, yes. because whatever it is about ballastol, just, I, I think this is done with mineral spirits? Yeah. Uh, I'm anyway. Sure it's written there somewhere, but it yeah, it's cut, formulated. This so. stuff cuts through WD-40. Oh, yeah. And nine times out of ten, WD-40 is the thing you're fighting. Oh, yeah. So, uh, thank Papap for <laughs> keeping the water out of your gun, but, but immediately yeah. switch over to this stuff. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Or... 
there's other brands. I'm not trying yeah, to say. Honestly, I want to say like. I wish they would pay me. Donald's don't right, pay yeah, me. Yeah, right. Yeah. If you're if you're, if you're watching this, yeah. Donald's if you're watching this, them well, yeah. That you bought their product <laughs> because of us. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Honestly, I would say like probably like a good half of the time when we get a gun that doesn't work, it's we just clean it and then it runs beautifully. <laughs> well, while we're talking about product, mm. uh, if you're on the go. Mm. And you need to, you're not shooting corrosive ammo. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do to sort of keep our gun up to date while we're moving around and kind of keep cleaning it as we go and not have to carry around all this crap? Yes. Yeah. Or yeah. snake. Or snake. Mm -hmm. So what this is, let me get it unbound yeah. here because this uh, is a shotgun one. It's a yeah, very pretty, large one. Pretty chunky one. But I got a big one so you guys could see it on camera. Mm -hmm. I have, let's no. go over to the... The close-up. I have a little brass uh, aglet. Yes, which some some not always, but sometimes have the the diameter like punched into it. Well, that'd be helpful. Mine says yeah, twelve. My, hey, uh, there you go. Okay, so boar snake comes um, slithering on by. We got a little bit of shoestring essentially. Yeah, basically. And what this is is to allow us to get down the length of the barrel before this bit hits the chamber. It's sort of like a initial mop, mm -hmm. but what's following behind that is brass yeah, brushes. Bristles, These are very yeah. aggressive. Yes, yeah, so, they're kind of sharp too. Yeah. yeah, one and two. <laughs> these will get pulled down the bore, mm -hmm. and then immediately after those, we have this Another big length of mop. Patch, yeah. And so what you can do is, especially with one of these guys, is you can run it through a few times, mm -hmm. and then honestly, you can soak sort of the the fattest section of the rear. You can soak it with some lubricant or oil, yep. and then and pull it through again one or two times, yep. and just this drag this through and really lubricate it. So mm -hmm. you pull it out gunk, then you start to lubricate, yes. and then as you use it, it'll kind of wear out of oil again, and then yeah, you just yeah. restock it. So it's... this is a handy way to kind of keep your gun up in the field mm -hmm. without going crazy, and then it just rolls back up. I tend to roll them up backwards, just as a mm -hmm. tip. Start with the ropey bit. Everybody then, starts with the stringy bit. Uh, yeah, never ends well. And then yeah. uh, finish up on the stringy bit and just wrap that around, mm -hmm. and you're good to go. So, boar snake is a great tool. Yes. Uh, as a sort of a touch-up. It is uh -huh. not in a solve no. everything. And I will say, you, you make sure you get the the precise one for the bore you're trying to run it through because much like oversized ammo, and I know again because of the different experience, I was like, ah, it's a little bit oversized. It'll just mean, you know, boy, it does not want to go in there. <laughs> <laughs> just, you're yanking on it and man. Uh, two, two, three, that would fit in the 22 chamber. Uh, yeah, <sighs> not, not so much. So yeah, uh, make sure it fits. But Boar Snake's a pretty good little product. Yeah, I, like, um, I have a quite a few. Everybody and then other than that, use your head. Like, mm. it's not... And by the way, we talked earlier about inspecting the gun. Mm. Cleaning and inspection happen simultaneously. Yes. We put them so far apart in this, but you're doing both at once. You're yeah. cleaning the gunk really and should. looking at what you got. And you're yep. cleaning the gunk and you're looking at what you got. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't doing those two things before you shoot any gun, no matter how much yeah. Grandpa told you he shot it last week, I want you to understand... Grandpa might be honest. He might have shot it. I want to go back to this. Grandpa shot it last week. Grandpa shot it 400 times last week. Yeah. It can blow up on the 401st. You don't know. Well, look at it. Yes. Look at the gun. It's not that Grandpa's a piece of crap. Mm -hmm. We love Grandpa. He's fine. But, yeah. He's real sharp. There's some, but there's some stuff you don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, especially, you know, I, I've gotten into the habit because I know I was lazy about it at first, but every time I ever either get given a gun or buy one somewhere... I'll just, I'm like, all right, it's going to suck, but I'm just going to pull it apart all the way, yeah. you know, and just check and be like, because you don't know what you have, you know, and it could be a time bomb and you don't know until you pull it apart. Right. And again, when you go to pull apart, screwdriver skills. That's yes. number one. Yes, screwdriver. And, you know, if you have to look up rat nest diagrams, there's a lot of you, some videos on YouTube for some some weirder guns. Where yeah. It's like, you know, like, I need to, because some of them are not obvious, you know, especially if you get to something kind of weird, you're like, I don't know how to take this apart. Google image search, yeah. blah, blah, blah diagram. You're nine times that ten yeah. you're fine. All right, so what is our next big question? Mm. How should I shoot this thing? All right, Bruno, mm. time to go pull the trigger. Cool. I'm going to load this magazine full of cartridges. Mm -hmm. Every, I'm going to, honestly. Just cram them all in there. It's got a capacity of five. I'm going to put five in there. I'm going to pull one in the chamber. Right. And I'm going to hold it down. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to get that ready. Right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna like, I'm just boom. Mm -hmm. But I think if I use my middle finger and like keep gonna, my finger here, I think I can just like, like yeah, really yeah, fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wanna go as gonna, fast as I can. You're gonna look really cool. Yeah. yeah. But you're not gonna be doing it very safely. Cause I know we've checked everything, but you still wanna take your time. I don't know why Bruno's out to ruin all my fun. I know, yeah. killjoy. But uh, 
We we know what the gun is. We know what it's chambered in. We have the right ammo. We cleaned it. We inspected. We inspected it. The gun's fine. So now we just go out and uh, you know go out into the woods somewhere. By yeah. Our, yeah. Just you know By whenever yourself. you want. Whenever you want. Yeah. No. I'm no. a loner. I'm a lone wolf. Right. Yeah. You don't. You don't need. And any I help. don't need no mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. Or help. what is it? I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, Basically, guys, don't uh, when you go test the stuff, don't go alone. Just take somebody with you, friends. Somebody needs to pick your broken butt back up. Yeah. Also, know where the nearest hospital is, and that's just in case. Yeah. Look, okay, take a friend, take mm. a med kit, and know how to yes. use it. Yes. Anytime you go shoot, these are these are shooting advice. This is yeah. Not, whenever you go to shoot, not just if you're testing no, old guns, just whenever. shooting alone without medical kit available or any training whatsoever, mm. and not knowing where the nearest emergency services are. Yes. Is just a recipe for disaster. Yeah, any you're, you're firearm, a, you're any asking time. for trouble. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we do remote shoots for Zane Arsenal, mm -hmm. you better believe we know where the nearest hospital is and oh, we have a kit yeah. with us. Mm -hmm. So you should too. And we're it's just a Google search. Yeah. So, uh, and again, friend, especially with old guys, mm -hmm. especially with old guns. Yes. Um. So you're out there, you're not by yourself. Mm -hmm. And we load up the magazine full to the brim, <laughs> plus a couple extra. Yeah, as many as you can cram in there. Okay. Because, yeah, you want to make sure it works, right? Yeah. Yeah. But maybe to be a little safer, you can start <laughs> with just one round. Uh -huh. I know. Not as fun, but one round. Okay, so I shoot my round. Yes. Into the air. Uh, pretty sure that's irresponsible slash illegal. Okay. <laughs> so definitely... Into the dirt. Uh, you could, yeah. Uh, just make sure you know, you know, where it's going, how far it's going in there. Okay. Does that help us at all with diagnosing the gun, though? Uh, no. Actually, I'm shooting into a wet embankment, so I can't even be sure whether I hit anything or not. How about yeah, that? that's uh, not great. No. Okay. What's no. your advice here? So definitely shoot at something where you can track the shot. Right. Uh, basically, especially if worst case scenario, maybe you get a squib. Right. The bullet doesn't quite leave the chamber. And you don't notice because you're just shooting off in the distance, and then you chamber another round, boom, bad idea. So get new, a target. New to you gun, yeah. new to you ammo, you've got to check that every round every leaves single, the barrel. Yes. Uh, make sure it doesn't get stuck anywhere in there. It could be clear, you know. doesn't matter if it's not super accurate as long as it's, you know, leaving yep. it out there. While you're doing that, mm. uh, you can leave up a piece of paper and see that you're getting clean holes where mm -hmm. you expect them to be. Yes. If you're not, you may have a problem called keyholing, which yeah. could be a, a part of a barrel bulge that maybe you missed during mm -hmm. inspection, which means the section of the barrel has bulked up more because previously someone had a squib right. or you, a rot. And you or, didn't really check and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Damage the crown. Yes. Um, you know, maybe you've somehow figured out the wrong diameter bullet and it's being squeezed, bored, and tumbled, or it's yeah, got too much room in tumbling. Or, yeah, or maybe it's just a defective bullet. Who knows? I yeah. mean, there's so many things. Or your gun sucks and has no rifling. That like, too. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, or, or a combination of all of this. <laughs> right. Is not, but not keyholing incorrect ballistic, like weird ballistics mm -hmm. on paper, Yeah. easy sign of some problems with the rifle. Yes. Um, usually not dangerous signs. No, but you definitely want to investigate and figure out why it's doing that. Right. Okay, so we've checked on our bullet by having a piece of paper downrange. Mm -hmm. Seems difficult. Uh, what do we do after we fire our one round? Well, uh, after it's fired, we have to extract and eject the spent casing. Assuming that it comes out nice and clean and easy, sure. we can read it like a tarot card. Yes. But if it doesn't maybe come not, out... Maybe not right away. It's kind of hot. <laughs> but yes. But let's cover one scenario first. This does not extract. Right, you open the bolt, let's say in this case, I believe that's a yeah. millimeter Mauser. You open the bolt, go back, and nothing. There's, right. And then you look and... If it's, by the way, if it's sticking, it's sticking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a spent cartridge. You know it's spent because you saw the bullet go somewhere. Mm -hmm. You are not in a super danger zone. No. You have time to fight with the bolt or whatever action it happens to be. Mm -hmm. But handgun, long gun, shotgun, whatever, mm -hmm. you go to extract and you get the action open, but the casing is still there. Mm -hmm. This is a time when you're gonna be very happy that you had and brought along a rigid cleaning rod. Mm -hmm. you can because use it. Because you've spent the round, mm -hmm. you're, you've seen it hit paper, Right. you can now take your cleaning rod down the bore and gently tap. sentry tap. Get it out of there. If no. gentle tapping does not get it, just mm -hmm. give up. Mm -hmm. That's the time to hit it with penetrating oil. Yeah, <laughs> Go dude. home, hit it with penetrating yeah, oil, hit it with a little heat, Mm -hmm. and then tap again. Yes. If you're hammering with the cleaning rod, mm -hmm. 
I'm going to tell you it's highly likely that you're going to get the cleaning rod stuck in the port too. That, yeah, we've seen that happen. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. seen bad things. Mm -hmm. So generally tapping will clean up most problems. Yes. Uh, but regardless whether you tapped it out or it came out on its own power, mm -hmm. we now have one of these. Mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. And this is a little small on the screen, but Bruno, walk me through. I'm going to, I'm going to inspect this for a moment. Yes. What am I looking for? Uh, uh, so, I have a case. Yes. So first thing in this case, for example, it's in one piece, which is good. That's so, a start. Yeah. One thing you want to check is, is the casing rupturing anywhere? Is it breaking? Is it stretching? Is it bulging? That could indicate some problem in the chamber. Could be pitting, could be, you know, erosion. Basically, there's more room for the case to expand than there should be, and that can create, in the worst case scenario, it could just catastrophically blow apart the case. Right. So I'm looking at an 8mm Mauser cartridge, mm -hmm. and you talk about bulging. I have maybe an ever so slight bulge uh, here. Yeah, a little bit. But that's probably just some chamber aging. Yes, it's it, is, it is an old gun, yes. And then uh, we know that the Gewehr 98 does not have a perfect seal. We actually have a little bit of unsupported case. True. And then that's the taper, so we're probably getting a little, little tiny bulge there. Not yeah. a big deal. No. It's extracting it's, clean and it's easy. It's holding, yeah. Should right. be fine. Okay, so what else can we see from this casing? So the other thing is something called frosting, mm -hmm. where you can, I'm not sure if the camera's picking it up, but this part is perfectly clean, and then it kind of gets sort of... Yeah, we're real shiny here. Really shiny, and then it gets and a little more matte. matte. Yeah, um, and that indicates sort of potentially a dirty chamber, or, you know, just scratching, scratching. Yeah. yeah, it's just uh, it, That could be what's causing the sticking so usually if that's the case you want to get in there and clean it out a little bit See if uh, that solves the problem if you have a case that is stuck mm -hmm. And you manage to get it back out nine times out of ten. You're gonna see deep, yeah a pretty deep yeah. matting and roughing up of this area mm -hmm. Because it just is full of dirt mm -hmm. uh, That's when you do the power drill trick with the nylon brush. Yes. Uh, as your first step. Yeah. Uh, do not continue to fire a gun that is sticking like that because you're not going to like extract any of that stuff. Yeah, it's going to be a pain. Just right. To, you're just going to yeah. make it worse. Mm -hmm. Just clean it out properly with a brush. Yeah. You can sit on field and maybe run a bore, an oversized, like a big big boar snake to there a few yeah, times and try one more you shot. You could, yeah. If it's up coming up, if, if it's tapping out real easy, okay, take yeah, a second enough, shot yeah. after cleaning it. Yeah, fine. it might be light enough that yeah, yeah. you might be able to do that. Um, but generally, this is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, what else can we check for? Mm -hmm. Maybe up here? This one's starting to show some signs. Actually. Yeah, this one's pretty dirty up by the neck. So we've got some blowover. Mm -hmm. uh, what that happens is that this case is not obturated uh, and, perfectly. And for those who don't know the fancy word, it just means the case stretches when the explosion happens. Right. Um, so this did not fill all the way up and gas seal at the front and mm -hmm. some of that powder and fouling escaped, yeah. made it back. Mm -hmm. This isn't so bad on a hundred year old gun. It's almost expected. At least. The fact that it didn't make it past the shoulder on this cartridge, mm -hmm. pretty good. Yeah. Now, if you had all this soot, you know, halfway down the case, uh, okay, now you're, now there's some... Also, I want to be honest things. here, this case did not look like this originally. Mm -hmm. uh, this was much lighter. This is a case that's been sitting around in an ammo can for some right. weeks. Sort of. And so it's developed more patina sure. as it's sat there. So this would, if it looked immediate like this coming out of the bore, I'd be mm -hmm. a little more worried. Mm -hmm. But even so, we sure. didn't clear the shoulder. We don't have it all the way down here. Mm -hmm. We're fine. That's fine. So, uh, mm -hmm. what else have we got going on? Well, uh, last thing we can look for is, well, we might have to yeah, turn it around, turn it the primer, which is spent now. It's a little out of focus, but that's okay because you're actually not looking at it head on like this. We're actually going to look at it from the side, and in this case, mm -hmm. you can't see it. No, which, which is, good, is, is really good. good. Yes. Because that means that our primer is flush to the face mm -hmm. of the back of the case. Yep. And so that means that it's not protruding out, nope. and it hasn't been hammered all the way in and stretched. If it were protruding out, we'd have some bad headspace issues. Yeah, yeah. Some of the gas is leaking and it's pushing the primer. It's kind of, it almost starts to extrude it uh, so back into the breech. It could be overpressured and popping out. Yes. It could be that the case was not properly supported and it had mm -hmm. room to pop out. Right. Uh, there's a couple things, but we yeah. don't want this sort of sticking out where you can, if you can run your thumb over and feel it raised, mm -hmm. there's some questions there. It doesn't mean that you're totally boned, but, no, but the more so, the worse. Yeah. So that is generally how you inspect a cartridge. There's, mm -hmm. there's other telltales like crackings and other things that get into it. Mm -hmm. If it completely separates at the rear, it means Ooh. that you probably had it unsupported. Yes. And then at that point, you really want to DQ that gun until it gets really looked at by a gunsmith, and you'll need an extraction tool to remove what's left of the case anyway. Yeah, it's not going to want to come out. All right, so we blew around. The case looks good. The bullet came out. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the gun. We need to see if anything's loosened up. Yes. Uh, you'd be amazed. Rear sights go, plint pins disappear. Oh, yeah. I had an SVT-40 that just, like, a pin just vanished after the first round. Yep. Gone. Uh, it had not been staked properly. Mm -hmm. So check, make sure there's no extra holes in your yes. gun, no loose screws, no yeah. nothing. Um, um, the wood, uh, I've had sometimes with some rifles where you shoot it and you'll notice the, the stock bolt gets a little grab, loose. Grab metal, grab wood, shake. Can shake it a bit. Uh, look for cracking in the wood. Ooh, yeah, my Lee Enfield did that the first time I shot it. Crack? Just kind of, uh, yeah, crack, a crack. Just, I don't know if it was there before again, because I think that was the first rifle I ever had, so it wasn't that peculiar by mm. looking at it and I noticed a crack I actually felt it thankfully it didn't go through my hand but I felt it at one point I was like oh and it's like a it's like a two inch crack mm. and I was like uh, I'm good yeah. <laughs> stop and do some repairs mm -hmm. so we inspect the gun we inspect the cartridge we do a couple of these two yep. three four mm -hmm. depends on the gun depends on the vulnerabilities in the gun sure soft Spanish metal uh, I'm gonna put like five or six single shots through it yeah. easy uh, and then we start doing just Doubles. Yes. Two at a time. Yeah. Uh, so boom, boom. And you're just checking to see that it feeds. Mm -hmm. And usually it's interesting, but I find that on most semi-automatics, the last round is the one that doesn't want to feed most of the time. Yeah. Because the follower is coming into play, it's dragging, you're getting, yeah, it's, you know. It gets weird. So if it's going to jam, it's going to jam on the last two rounds anyway. Mm -hmm. So you run those two rounds. If you have jams, you go look into why. Mm -hmm. uh, if you clear the two rounds, load her up. Yeah, right? it should be good. Like, if you start get through a couple doubles, mm -hmm. okay, let's start shooting this thing. Yeah, it, it's the, the point is incrementally doing it. You don't want to load it all the way up, and worst case scenario, you have a runaway gun, you know, firing pin gets stuck or whatever, and suddenly you've, instead of only two, if it's got two rounds, that's all that can come out. If you have a full mag, ugh. Yeah. yeah, and you always want to reinspect. So we're going to have a nefarious episode soon mm. about probably the worst revolver of World War One. <laughs> and in that gun, I will tell you, I had a handful of rounds to test it with, mm -hmm. and I ran... Seven rounds through that gun, six round gun. Mm -hmm. I ran one cylinder, mm -hmm. uh, reduced load, right. uh, ran great. And I said, Oh, good. Because we test everything before we take it all the way out of the range. Yeah, so we don't get any nasty surprises. Mm -hmm. So I ran through six rounds and then I went to hand it to somebody else and I said, Try this goofy thing out. Mm -hmm. He fired one round, then he fired a second round and it just kind of clicked. Mm -hmm. And when I opened it up, the, the strike was outside the primer. Because Ooh. it had completely untimed itself mm. because it was made out of soft metal, some Spanish piece of junk. And I knew it was a risky gun when we started into it, and the person mm -hmm. I was working with knew. Um, but well, that's dull. it had done seven dead on. And every time I shot, I would bam, I would open up and I had dead center primer because I was worried about this exact scenario. Mm -hmm. And then All of a sudden. it had made it a full outside the primer, like, like over 30% walkout, mm -hmm. which is good. Because if it had just done that 20, if it had hit in that range where it was going to really shave lead on a soft frame on a gun, it's so weird that it walked out that far and I was very thankful that it did because it was enough to not discharge. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it went in between round seven and eight is when it went out of walk. Mm -hmm. So you're not out of the woods until you're out of the woods. You yeah. know? Uh, nothing, take nothing for granted. So mm -hmm. I don't need you to be completely paranoid, but... Yeah. Let's let's issue some tests before yeah, you, we start trusting these you things. You can't run too many tests. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's that's really, I think, the basics for shooting these things. Um, yeah. Bullet uh, and case inspection, yes. gun inspection. Oh, uh, heat buildup. Oh, that's Excessive a weird one. heat buildup, yeah. Uh, Not so common, but... Yeah, you can start to get some heat building up. That means that something may be under-lubricated. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, guns get hot. Oh, yeah, yeah. The barrel's yeah, going to yeah. get hot. Especially, you know, more powerful cartridges. But, it's going to get toasty. But. Especially if you've shot more modern stuff or you've shot stuff that you know is reliable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can be like, you know, I've only got five rounds of this barrel. And it, it should is, not be this hot. Yeah. I'm feeling it through the handguard. Right. That's a sign that mm -hmm. something is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, also, heat in weird place on the mechanism too soon. Mm -hmm. That could be an indicator or something. And again, it's all, that's sliding scale. That's more advanced stuff that mm -hmm. you get used to. But if it's, you're shooting a gun that you've shot this model before, but this other model's heating up differently, mm -hmm. might be a warning sign. Mm -hmm. uh, so stuff like that. But yeah. it's really just common sense. Yeah, stuff. and by the way, if you have a gun and you want to test fire, but you're not 100% sure that yes. it's, you know, you're like, I, I, or you just want to play it super duper safe. Right. And you're like, you know, you don't have to shoulder it. That and is... 
highly. Yeah, I probably should actually let with that actually yeah. is you can strap it to ideally like a, a if it, we'll use a rifle as an example like a, a kind of a bench or a rest. They have sleds for this stuff. Oh yeah, just, and I mean and that's locks if in. If that's too fancy for you, honestly, you could sandbag it down. You could like you know yeah, lash go it to, to a tire. Go to Lowe's couple of like five dollars of sandbags honestly yeah just make sure it's nice and cemented there and take yourself out of the equation just maybe tie a lanyard around it obviously triple check where it's aiming at because you're not holding it anymore trigger pull can't exceed the point that it actually pulls out from what it's doing right like you can do that mm -hmm. uh what i would not recommend mm -hmm. is over reinforcing the rear so people will mm -hmm. like put it up against a tree right the gun's actually not designed to have no recoil so if right. you butt a gun up against the yeah, if, you, if you if you put it up against something that has no give, it's that energy. Has yeah, to you go can somewhere. blow the stock out. It expects yeah. you to kind of absorb be some soft. of it. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good point. You mm. don't have to put your head by the gun. Especially if it's a gun that you feel might be kind of sketchy or you just got a bad feeling about it. Just do the whole. I'll do all your tests. Just tie it down. Yeah. Or have a gunsmith do that whole bench test. Sure. Yeah, that's something they can do. But that's very true, actually. I mean, we did kind of skip that step. Mm. You can. You can honestly sled or I, yeah, sandbag. The that's rifle. the way I prefer to do it, at least for the first shot. You know, just because the idea runs through my head if I go and shoulder it. And yeah, well, yeah. actually, you had an experience with that with a well, rifle. That yeah, <laughs> kind I had of a, turned you into a bit of a porcupine for a bit. Oh my god! The worst part is I did the preventative. So there's another thing yes. that you can do, and this one's not recommended. Mm. But I'm going to tell you about it. Sure. Because it's a soft trick. Let's say you have a gun that you trust the metal on. Mm -hmm but you don't trust the wood, sure. or you're afraid of, because nine times out of 10, especially on a rifle, yeah, if it's, it's gonna fail, it's probably the metal's not gonna fail, the wood is gonna fail. It's gonna blow gas, mm -hmm. it's gonna get real shaky, it's gonna have a rupture of sorts, but there's not gonna be flying metal. Mm. What's gonna happen is there's gonna be flying wood. Mm. And I've had this happen to me. I had mm. a veterally just detonate explode yeah. and it blew wood splinters into my forehead mm. I had safety glasses on because Thankfully. I'm not a dumb dumb mm -hmm. um, but uh, we had missed a section of unsupported case in our inspection and everything checked except this one little bit of unsupported case that we didn't <laughs> expect mm -hmm. And it just uh, hot cast in the magazine well the magazine well expanded mm -hmm. and when it expanded so suddenly it blew the wood right so nothing about this was fatal or even potentially fatal for me. If I'd had no eye protection, yeah. it could have been blinding. Sure. But not fatal. No. But still. There's a thing you can do to mitigate that, which is a heavy wool blanket like this or a towel. Mm. Uh, you can actually wrap the action with a single shot in the chamber. Make sure you can mm. see your sights and know where you're pointed. But you can actually wrap the action in such a way that if it were to blow wood, the wood splinters are contained. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem with that is by the time you think you need that method, it's probably you could have just done the sled. Right. So let's go with the sled first. Mm -hmm. But if it's working on the sled and you're still doubtful, maybe towel wrap mm -hmm. it and tr try it a few times. Your right hand's still highly at risk. Sure. Um, and by the way, I am encouraging no handling of unsafe firearms. No. And at all points in which you are unsure, the gunsmith is the answer. This is not advising someone yeah, to do something Yeah, this is not something, something you want to, yeah. These are just mitigations that we have encountered. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not an instructional video on how to do this. No. This is a recommendation about what you can do, do. and should do with proper supervision. Mm -hmm. Uh, and have expert advice on hand. The point being is none of this is like out there in the zeitgeist right now except in little bits and pieces and mm -hmm. we're trying to put it into one place. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm pointing at. Okay, so okay. Uh, we shot mm -hmm. our gun. Mm -hmm. We haven't died. Mm -hmm. We shot multiple rounds. Then we load up the mag and we're ready and we now have a running gun and we're happy with it. Cool. Uh, is there anything we need to be concerned about immediately after shooting it? Uh, Corrosive ammo. Yes, we, we talked about that. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you definitely, if you shot old surplus or anything that you know is corrosive, probably if you can yep. clean it on the spot, just because I know I've forgotten and like, ugh, I hate opening guns and seeing all that rust in there. Yep. And after your first successful range day, I highly recommend doing a complete deep clean all over again, because you'll yeah. catch things on the second inspection you wouldn't have caught before. From yeah. there on, once you've gotten two good range days out of it. With inspection, statistically, well, it's, it's probably good. Yeah, yeah. You, you're probably again probably safe. Sure, we are uh, not advising. No, but yeah. yeah. 
So uh, that should pretty much cover that, yeah, right? Yeah, went through the whole process, good. yeah. How do I store this properly? All right, Bruno, mm. we're done shooting. Yep. We had a good time? Yeah, it's pretty fun. Leave it in the dirt, walk away. <laughs> I mean, if she wants to throw money away, sure. Okay. But, uh... <laughs> Perfectly good handgun. Yeah. Okay, I tell you what. I get what you're saying. Mm. I will spritz it lovingly with moose milk, mm. and then I'm going to take it and put it in a sock. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to put this, I'm going to be honest with you, my apartment's kind of cramped. Uh -huh. So there's really only a little space left under the radiator. Mm. So I'm just going to, it, it. it drips a bit, but this is, yeah, it should be no, fine. it's fine, it's fine. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. going to put the, because if it drips on it, it'll just heat back up, it'll evaporate. Yeah, who cares? Okay, so I'm going to put it in the sock, I'm going to mm -hmm. put it under the radiator. Yes. I'll come back for it six months. Yeah, and then you'll be a sad, sad boy. Well, every time I ask you a question, it seems like I'm a sad, I sad know, boy. Yeah, I'm the designated killjoy. Yeah. Okay, you know what I wanted, Bruno? I wanted a, I wanted a hobby. Mm -hmm. I just want it stupid. Grandpa gave me the gun. I know. I wanted just to have a just hobby. Shove some some rounds in it. Yeah. This is it. sounding like it's, it's taking work, a lot of time. Man. Mm -hmm. It sounds expensive. Yeah. You keep it making me go to this gunsmith guy for no reason. Right. Yeah. Sounds like a scam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah. nuts to you. It's going under the radiator. Uh huh. I mean, it's your gun. You can do whatever you want, but uh, you know, really hot places are not really good for guns. <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna not gonna end the world for you. All right. How do you store your firearm? Mm. This gets tricky because there's two layers to this. There's what's good for the gun, mm -hmm. and then there's what's good for your family, children, and anybody mm -hmm. that may interact with it. Mm -hmm. We are not addressing the security part of this. No. Uh, and so, at all levels of this advice, you apply the security level oh, yeah. that you feel is appropriate for your home and your family, mm -hmm. okay? We're just talking about so the survivability mm, of the gun. gun, yes. The survivability of the people that is that's on you. That's on you. Mm -hmm. We're just talking about the gun. Uh, what kind of weather do guns like? Uh, well, not not radiators, <laughs> not really hot places. They no. tend to like people weather. Uh, generally yeah, about the yeah. about a comfortable humidity for you is a comfortable humidity for the gun. That's a good rule Roughly. of thumb. Roughly, yeah, There's, good rule of thumb. We can get into the science of it, but generally, yeah, 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 yeah. if you think that you would feel sweaty or uncomfortable in the space that the gun is in, the that. gun is probably going to get sweaty and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And the big problem you're going to find is that with temperature changes, guns are made out of metal. They have components that are non-metal. Yeah. They're going to pick up uh, any kind of moisture in the air. It's oh, going to suck it right in. It's yep. going to do on them. Mm -hmm. Like it's going to, it's going to condensate on them mm -hmm. and it's going to get into the wood. It's going to get mm -hmm. into the, you know, so we don't want radical temperature changes. Nope. Uh, and we don't want moisture. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want it so incredibly arid that we start to get cracking. No, yeah, so it's with wood, yeah. It's so average people humidity, average people temperature, mm -hmm. keep it indoors, air conditioned with you. That's yeah. the best environment for these things. Yeah. Uh, and then keep it lubricated. Yeah. Do not put it in a place where it has something just up against it all the time if you can help it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you notice most gun safes, which I highly recommend, uh, they have like racks that have minimal physical contact with the long gun. So the long gun will go in, the butt plate will be on the ground, and then the uh, somewhere around the handguard area or barrel area, I'm bunking my own equipment so I'm sure I'm making noise. It's going to have like one point of contact. Yeah, so that's it. It's going to be soft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, felt usually. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to try to avoid leaving moisture there. You can even find some old guns that have rack marks from being in the rack there because that's where the condensation hit. Mm -hmm. So that's it. You're going to minimize touching it. You want to leave it to the air and you want the air to be good. Yes. Um, and then with handguns, same thing, there's wire stands and things. Mm -hmm. You can leave them on their side. If you have really good humidity control, like desiccant and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, and yet, again, not overtly dry, although handguns tend to be more, since they're usually Bakelite or plastic or something like that. Yeah, they're not, not susceptible, wood. yeah. Yeah, they're not as susceptible so to the, being overly dry. Mm -hmm. But um, handguns, same thing. You can lay them on their side, mm -hmm. but I would tend not to try to have them in like, you don't want to put it on a pillow that's going to contour around it and touch everything. Yeah. With this particular handgun, if I set it on side, realistically, only 10% of it's making contact. Mm -hmm. uh, that's better. Um, and that's really it. It's, it's not as hard as you think it is. No. People tend to make a big deal out of it, and they tend to screw up where they shove them in the basements. Basements have terrible temperatures. They shove them in an attic with terrible temperature control. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they forget about them. Yeah. A <laughs> lot of it is that change in temperature mm -hmm. allowing humidity oh, yeah. to form on the gun. It's no good. And then drip around. Yep. If you can keep it from building dew, 
you should be pretty okay. Yeah. Uh, on a related note, though, assuming we're coming back from the range of this thing, yeah, lubricate it, but also wipe it down. Oh especially yeah, especially we've been touching it. Especially if I've been touching. Yeah, it. we talked about the red beard. Yeah, thing. we've been to the same thing. Yeah, if, 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 you, you can even tell in this one because the finish is looking kind of decent on it. You'll see, you know. Yeah, I should say before you rack it, that is really the time. I'm not mm. kidding. Oh yeah, just melt. Just it's cheap and easy too. Oh yeah, just scrub it down. Um, uh, I take this and uh, I just spray it on the rag and I just wipe it down so it's moist and I leave it somewhere where it can kind of dry. Mm -hmm. I then put it away, minimizing my fingers on metal. Like I tend to. Get it, I tend to get it a little lubricated. Yeah. I hold it in such a way that I'm not touching sure. the metal. And, yeah. and then I just set it down. Well, honestly, yeah, if you don't want to be a concern, just glove. Yeah. You know, just one hand, doesn't even have to be two. You yeah. know, just clean with yeah. the other. You're Crappy work glove sitting yeah. in the safe. Or you know, if, or if you want to be lazy sometimes, see if it's like a, a hoodie or a long sleeve, just kind of grab you it like you that. oil on your sleeve. Well, yeah, sure, but. You know. I don't think it's weird to keep like one cheap work glove in the safe so that you can Honestly, handle no, things that's a, that's a really good because idea. if you're going to reach in there and try to find something else in there mm -hmm. you instead of wiping hand oil on everything you can just move it around so don't be i know it feels weird to have the gloves on every time you handle it it's not about that it's about the number of times you're going to be like mm -hmm. where is that gun i want and yeah, you're just you're gonna touching everything and, and, and you're going to forget to wipe it down yeah. and you come back later and you're going to be like Ugh. you're going to be wiping it later and you'll be like Man, there's like a fingerprint on here. Like, there's guys' fingerprints from a hundred years ago on these oh, guns. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just, I mean, if you really want to sign it, I guess that's on you. It's your gun, but yeah, I tend to Most try to keep don't. mine off there. Uh -huh. So yeah, I think that's is that our whole story. Yeah, that's the whole cycle. I think until you go out and shoot it again. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've kind of walked you through this. It's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have a lot of opinions. Uh, I want to say the number one thing you can do at this point before you leave this video is go check the comments because mm. we are not perfect people. Oh no. There are That's always going to be mitigating factors. There's mm. always going to be other things that happen. Weird edge cases, yeah. So what I would like to do is some of you who are watching this are more experienced. If you feel like we missed something, say it in the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had an experience that went poorly because mm. of overlooking something Definitely. and you would like to warn other people or yeah. give advice, say it in the comments. Mm. And I would really like to drive people to talk to each other mm -hmm. on this video. Yeah. And really make a concerned effort. Like, I want you to really dig into the comments on this video. Mm. Uh, some people are going to call us idiots. Probably. Because they're going to say, that this thing isn't scientifically yeah, you, whatever. Or you forgot this thing or right. whatever, yeah. Uh, this is not meant to be, as I said at the beginning of this. This is not exhaustive. Mm -hmm. It is no protection against harm. Mm -hmm. uh, what it is, is us trying to push some information out there that we wish we had heard sooner. Mm -hmm. And hopefully some of you find it useful. Yeah. And if more of you can contribute and put down good comments below, yeah. excellent. Everybody, I, everybody th wins, this yeah. video is here to help other people come in, not damage the guns, not damage themselves. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's an interesting hobby, and I know I, I'm sort of came into it recently, and there's yeah, there's a lot of stuff you don't usually have to think about. Um, it's a lot of stuff I've learned just from hanging out with you guys or going to shows, talking to people. There's a lot of information to to pick up. Oh yeah, yeah, just. I mean, as much as we talked about everything, we never even got into like how to select a shotgun cartridge for what oh, you're doing, or, yeah. oh, no, or like yeah, there's, yeah. two and five eighths versus two and three quarter in the chamber. Which mm. again, especially with shotguns, know what you're doing. Don't just shove ammo in there. Mm. There's there's all sorts of stuff. Some of it's going to appear in the comments. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to link some resources that you might like. Mm. Uh, and the good thing about comments is they can stay up to date. We can't edit the video. Nope, uh, we can only take it down and put up a whole new one and wipe everything out. Mm -hmm. But comments. Mm, you can but go in and edit. Some, yeah. And we can get some links down in the description as people start to give us good ones. We'll try to keep it updated. We'll mm -hmm. really try to stay with this thing. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope it was some help. Otherwise, have a good one. Bye. Right. Special thanks to CNS Shooting Sports in North Charleston for allowing us to use their meeting room again. We only kept them up until 3 a.m. this time. Not too bad. Hey, Bruni, what you got there? I don't have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Recording for tests. We believe this will be too dark. Beep bop boop bop beedly boop boop beep bop beep booty bop. Alright, I think that's pretty good staging. Looks I'm just gonna do a quick test to make sure that you're not coming out too blue. Hey Billy, what you got there? Nope, I was literally echoing when you did that. It's just a test recording for me to check something. It's gonna, it's gonna 
go over and yeah, search and get shut down by the bolt if we don't put the sleep there. What? Let me see. Yeah, that's not shut. No, no, it's just, just go with that. How is that five? I know it's another five pounds. That is in shot. Effort into this no, gun. If you go to the top It took us two years to get this thing into production. We're going to make more of them, okay? Those. Those we're making those. That's the only reason it's like... Hugo Sad. Aww. <laughs> Everybody's been going on about Hugo Sad now. So you're going to be the one fiddling with it. Where are you going to hold it? Hey, Billy. What you got there? Gee, mister, I don't have a goddamn clue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll be handling most stuff. But... Yeah. Oh, actually, that came up for you. The monitor's kind of different. Is that too close? Do I need to give you more wiggle room? The test recording for the final. Is your hat where they're going to be? Ooh. Hey. Uh, is your hat going to be where it's going to be? No, I'm going to put my hat on. Okay. Now, both of you, do me a favor and look at this camera for five, four, three, two, one. Look at each other. Blah, 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 blah. Nope, keep looking at each other for okay, a full so five seconds. Okay, so what I was going to say is you need to not put your dick in that. Oh, Thank well, you. That's all I need. Gee, Bruni, what you got there? Uh, gee, mister, I have no idea. <laughs> and then I'm going to need you to grab something, May, because I don't have it. Mm -hmm. I don't have the ballastol or the moose milk or anything. Uh, I didn't even think about it. I'm just going to do it off the zoom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You want to pull, put it off to the right if you pull it in. That's fine. No, I'm just going to throw it on the thing. Here. <laughs> oh boy, the green cans. And I'm probably a little too high for my point of focus, but this stuff should say. Look at the camera for five, four, three, two, one. At each other. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Don't dry fire and don't ah. touch the cellar. Oh, crap. I didn't say don't dry fire and don't dry fire. Mm. All right, one it's more so time. Important. Yeah. I'm checking our audio. Ooh. All right, let's wind it up again. Yeah. We're getting slow because we're tired. Mm -hmm. Come here. Well, gee, Bruno, what mm. did Grandpa give you? No clue. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Uh, Some kind of gun, I think, but that's about as far as I got.